colleagues. I would like to welcome members of the public to this meeting of the Council, particularly those watching the live stream on the Council's YouTube channel. The Council supports the principle of transparency and encourages filming, recording and uh, making, taking photographs at its meetings that are open to the public. Members are advised, therefore, that this meeting may be filmed, recorded or photographed. We are meeting at the Burgess Hall at St Ives. This is in order to follow the guidelines we have received from public health to manage an indoor meeting of this size during a COVID pandemic. Members are asked to remain in their seats for the entire meeting. In order to do so, Council must suspend standing orders in relation to section 19.1, Standing to Speak, Part 4.1, Council Procedure Rules, Part 4, Rules of Procedure, which I know you've all memorized, to enable members to sit while speaking so that their voices can be picked up by the microphone system. So can I ask members to indicate their support for that suspension of standing orders by a show of hands? Thank you, I think that's unanimous. In order to register to speak, you need to raise your hand. You will then be automatically added to the chair's list of speakers. If you have a point of order, you will need to raise your hand and shout chair. And just to remind you, this means that there's been an alleged breach of the council rules of procedure or law. The chair will need you, the member, to indicate the rule or law which you consider has been broken or to give a personal explanation, which, again, to remind you, may only relate to some material part of an earlier speech by the member which may appear to have been misunderstood in the present debate. Please can I ask all members to turn their mobile phones to silent or vibrate whilst the meeting is taking place. So I have some apologies for absence. I have apologies from councillors Criswell, Reynolds, Dew, Dan Schumann, and Jerry Bird. Do I have any other apologies? We move then to the first item of business, which is the election of the Chair of Council. Please may I have nominations for the Office of Chair of Council for the remainder of the municipal year. Uh, Councillor Netzinger. I'd like to nominate um, Councillor Stephen Ferguson, please. Thank you, do you have a seconder? I believe so. Uh, Councillor Machini, uh, did you want to say anything? Um, I'm happy to, would you like me to speak now? Um, I would like, fir first of all, actually, before I say anything about Stephen, I would like to say how wonderful it is to have Derek Giles with us this morning as the outgoing chair of this council. Here, yeah, here. Yeah. Um, following his major surgery, it is fantastic that he's able to join us again, um, and he has the absolute full support and um, great affection of this council as he makes his recovery. Uh, so, to, um, secondly, I'm delighted to be proposing another independent councillor from St Neots to take on his role as chair of this council. Stephen Ferguson has made a hugely impressive impact in his first seven months as a county councillor. He has been a very active and energetic member of the Environment and Green Investment Committee and, it has, been, um, and, and has made a really impressive imp um, impression on many of us. Uh, it has been wonderful to have so many new faces taking on significant new positions of responsibility under the new joint administration. And it is in that spirit of renewal that I am delighted that Stephen has agreed to offer to chair this council a role I am sure he will perform brilliantly over the next year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Netzinger. Do I have any other nominations? Councillor Count. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'd like to nominate Councillor Mac Maguire for the position of chair. Councillor Mac Maguire has a long history of being county councillor and district councillor. He's held in high regard by many. He's an experienced chair, which I feel under the current situation has proved to be necessary and will prove to be necessary in the future. He enjoys the full confidence of our group and I'm sure many across the council recognise that he is both apolitical when it comes to the role of chair and able to ha handle the role of chair well. The position of chair also involves representing the council at outside events, and we feel that his dignity, his moral standards, his ethical standards are well suited to this, which is why we have 
put forward an alternative suggestion this morning uh, 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 for the position of chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Count. Do you have a seconder? Councillor Schumann? Thank you, Chair. I don't intend to say anything for the Council. Thank you. Do I have any other nominations? There are no other nominations, so I propose to take a vote. So those in favour of Councillor Ferguson, please indicate now. Those in favour of Councillor Maguire, please indicate now. Please. The result of the vote is 31 votes in favour of Councillor Ferguson and 23 votes in favour of Councillor Maguire. Councillor Ferguson is duly elected. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Ferguson. You are, it says here, formally declared the chair of the council until the annual meeting in 2022. <laughs> Please can I ask you, Councillor Ferguson, to take considerable care approaching your seat, because we do not want this to be the shortest lived chairmanship <laughs> of Yes, uh, that's, my, that's my point. I, Stephen Ferguson, having been elected to the office of Chair of the Cambridgeshire County Council, declare that I take this office upon myself and will duly and faithfully fulfil the duties of it according to the best of my judgment and ability. I undertake to observe the Council's code of conduct in the performance of my functions in that office. I just want to say thank you very much for your faith in me today and for bestowing onto me the greatest honour of my professional and political career. I vow to be a fair and impartial chair and will tirelessly work to uphold the purpose of this, const of this constitution. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of the meetings of the council held on the 9th of November. Sorry, Councillor Giles wanted to speak before I get there. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Just a few words, congratulations, um, and also thank you to Councillor Kindersley for stepping in when I couldn't physically step in. <laughs> However, I want you to assure you, I want your assurance that you do not, you do not, are you listening? Yeah, well done. That you do not try and break my two records. One is probably the shortest reigning chairman of this council, and also um, the, uh, the the record of having uh, oh, somebody's just thrown me banana thinking about uh, the record of having a complaint listed against me on my very very first full council meeting, which I understand is still relevant. Now, whether that's going to be passed to you or not, I don't know. But anyway, congratulations. Keeping it in St. Neots, wonderful. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Giles. I think St. Neots, Chairman of Council, County Council, a bit like buses. You wait forever for one and then two arrive all at once. So thank you for that. Um, I, on behalf of the Council, I'd like to thank you, Councillor Giles, for your service and, as Chair. 
um, and I'm going to confirm that the, the chairman's badge, will, the chair's badge, will be sent to you in due course. Thank you, Derek. He already had it. Item number two uh, is the approval of the minutes of the meetings of the council held on the 9th of November 2021 and 25th of January 2022. The council is asked to agree that these are a correct record. Do I have a proposer and a seconder? Councillor Nasinga and Councillor Machini, thank you very much. Anybody would like to comment or debate these minutes? So with no objections, I think we can uh, agree that these minutes are approved, so we'll take that as carried. Uh, next is chair, Chair's announcements. Do I have the Chair's announcements? As you are aware from my election as chair and agenda item number seven, the previous chair of the council, Derek Giles, has regrettably resigned for role due to ill health. Councillor Giles has expressed the great honour of serving as chair and paid tribute to the support he has received from officers, councillors and the vice chair, uh, Sebastian Kindersley. As members will also be aware, Gillian Beasley, our chief executive for the last six years, retired at the end of December. I know that the Strategy and Resources Committee thanked Gillian after its meeting in December, but I do think it's important that Council also thanks Gillian. We are hugely grateful to Gillian for her stewardship of the Council since 2015 and wish her a long and healthy retirement. After a 35-year career in local government, Wendy Ogle Wellborn, Cambridge and Petersburg's Executive Director for People and Communities, retired in January 2022. Wendy began her career in Cambridgeshire in 1987 as a res residential worker and went on to qualify as a social worker. After managing all of the council's family support and adolescent care service, she left in 2004 to head up children's commissioning in Bedfordshire before being appointed as director of commissioning at es Essex County Council. In 2012, she moved across to Peterborough and in 2017 took, the, took a joint role across Cambridgeshire and Peterborough as the executive director of people and communities. I'm sure the council will wish to join with me in wishing Wendy a long and healthy retirement. I'm also delighted to report that Charlotte Back, currently Director of Adult Social Care, is Acting Executive Director for People and Communities following the retirement of Wendy for, for at least the next six months, from January 2022. Charlotte has worked in the NHS and managed children's services for seven years and adult services for eight years. Finally, Lou Williams, Director of Children's Services, has taken a difficult decision to take early retirement and plans to leave in February 2022. After very carefully thinking, he has come to the view that both authorities now need a Director of Children's Services who is able to give three or four year commitment as the Council manages post-COVID pressures and financial challenges, as well as grasp new opportunities, such as the Children and Maternity Collaborative as part of the Integrated Care System. I am sure the council will wish to join me in wishing Lou a long and healthy retirement. Finally, we have one additional announcement. It gives me great pleasure to award Michelle Rowe with her 25 year long service award. Well done, Michelle. Agenda item number four is declarations of interests. Uh, under this item, members are asked to declare interest under the code of conduct in any item of, for, the, for today's agenda if they are not already registered on the register of interests. Members will wish to note that the monitoring officer has exercised her discretion to grant a dispensation to all elected members taking part in the debate on the council's business plan today. Do I have any other declarations of interests? Councillor Bowden. Thank you, Chair. Although it's not a personal pecuniary interest, uh, on agenda item 11, I will not be speaking nor will I be voting, given that I'm a member of the Audit Registration Committee of the Institute of Chartered Accountants for England and Wales, which regulates the ability of auditors to do audit, including public audit. So I will not participate, even though it's not a pecuniary interest. Thank you, Councillor Bowden. Any other declarations? Thank you, that's noted.
agenda item number five is public question time, which allows members of the public to ask questions at the council, provided they've given advance notice. We've received no questions, so we can move on to item six on petitions, which allows members of the public to present petitions in accordance with the agreed protocol. We've also had no petitions, so we can now move on to agenda item number seven. Agenda item number seven is a report asking the council to note urgent decisions taken by the chief executive following the decision to call off the meeting of the council scheduled for the 14th of December following advice from the director of public health. Can I ask the chair of the Constitution and Ethics Committee, Councillor Kindersley, to move the recommendations as set out on, re on the report on page five to be adopted and the vice chair of Constitution and Ethics, Councillor Bullat, to second. Uh, Chair, I am pleased to move the recommendation as set out on page five of the report relating to the urgent decisions taken by the Chief Executive. Thank you. Councillor Count. Yeah, apologies for the interruption, Chair. I've had a message from a member of the public that says it's difficult for them to follow this on YouTube. The sound is way too low. So uh, apologies for the interruption, but I felt you might wish to try and address that. Thank you. That's really important. I hope that our technical helpers will be able to address that, but it's really important. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Yeah. Councillor Bullock. Uh, Chair, happy to second the recommendation. Thank you. Do we have any speakers on this item? So I think then, with uh, since we general agreement, so we can take that as carried. Agenda item number eight is the council's business plan and budget proposals for 2022-23 to 2026-27. Uh, which was discussed by the Strategy and Resources Committee on 27th of January 2022. The debate on the business plan will be conducted in accordance with the detailed procedure note circulated, circulated to members on the 13th of January 2022. I propose to suspend any standing orders in connection with the business plan debate in order to accommodate the agreed procedure. Councillor Kindley, you second that? Uh, Chair, I'm happy to second the suspension of standing orders. Is everybody okay with suspending those standing orders? Thank you. Can I now ask the Chair of the Strategy and Resources Committee, Councillor Nessinga, to move the recommendations as set out in the report on the Council agenda? Happy to move the recommendation, Chair. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Machini? Yes, please, I second and I will reserve my right to speak. Thank you. I am now inviting the leaders of the Liberal Democrat, Labour, no, sorry, Councillor Nessinga. Thank you very much. <coughs> I would like to present for full Council's consideration and approval the Council's business plan, setting out how we will spend the resources we have available to achieve our vision and priorities for Cambridgeshire. Through this budget, we deliver a balanced budget for 2022-23. In doing so, this council undertakes financial planning covering a five-year timescale so that we can align spending plans with the projected resources available and ensure that we recognise and to prov provide for growth in demand for those services. The papers before full council include our financial, capital and treasury management strategies. Our financial situation remains challenging. COVID-19 has resulted in increased costs for our supply chain, an increase in the complexity of needs for those we support, and the council continues to be disadvantaged by an unfair central government funding distribution. In December, the government announced its provisional local government finance settlement. This is a key part of the budget setting process as it confirms several financial allocations from government departments and the principles for setting council tax. The headline government announcement was that Cambridge's core spending power would increase by 8%, but around two thirds of that is due to the additional council tax that the settlement allows us to precept and that government assumes will be utilized. And yet again, only a one year settlement has been announced. While this gives certainty over government grant funding in 2022-23, it does not help with setting a financial plan over the medium term. The funding announced as part of the settlement is not sufficient to meet the additional pressures placed upon us as part of the autumn budget in October. 
the settlement did not announce any continuation to government support for free school meals during the holidays or for the household support fund. The announcement that fairer funding may be implemented in 2023-24 is welcome. However, it continues to leave Cambridgeshire at a disadvantage for at least another financial year. Despite this, we continue to strive to support our citizens to ensure Cambridgeshire is a place we are proud to call home. The Council continues to take a central role in coordinating the response of public services to respond to complex, the complex public health situation, the impact on vulnerable people, education of our children and young people, and the economic consequences. We are in the middle of the winter pressures of a new variant, coupled with other seasonal illnesses impacting on hospital capacity, alongside delivery of an accelerated vaccine booster programme. We are already seeing the impacts of the pandemic on our vulnerable groups, as well as those who have become vulnerable as a result of health or economic impacts from the pandemic. Longer term, there will be significant increases and changes in the pattern of demand for our services alongside the economic after effects. This proposed business plan, in this proposed business plan, there are COVID-19 impacts across demand for services, pricing and supplier changes and impacts on funding and income. We are clear that this remains an extraordinary time to be setting a budget. Between December and January meetings of the Strategy and Resources Committee, we needed to recognize an increase of 2.5 million in the costs of providing care and our own social care workforce as a result of the significant pressures and labor shortages facing the sector. Emerging work is shifting the Council's decision-making framework to prioritize sustainable development for our county, so citizens' social foundations are strengthened in the context of pandemic recovery and ongoing ecological emergency. To do this, Cambridgeshire County Council's joint administration proposes to set up a £14 million fund to tackle inequality, improve lives and care for the environment. Our Just Transition Fund aims to support a move to a more sustainable economy in a way that is fair for everyone. Just Transition aims to support good quality jobs and decent livelihoods during the period where some industries and ways of behaviour decline while others expand to take their place, creating a fairer and more equal society. That's what makes it just. In its first year, if agreed, the Just Transition Fund will fund schemes that increase flood prevention, continuing our rapid increase in gully clearance, that help tackle climate change, that widen opportunities for children with special educational needs and disabilities, that increase independent living services, that expand direct payments and individual service funds Can where you adults... Can sum up now, Councillor Singer? Time's Sorry. up. Time's up. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a note on the sound on the YouTube. Apparently the sound is working properly, but I'd advise members to speak up and speak clearly so people at home can understand. I'm now inviting the leaders of the Liberal Democrat, Labour, Independent and Conservative groups or the nominees to make their opening statements on the business plan. The five li minute time limit, as you've just seen, will be applied to all speeches. This one's quite short. Um, having explained at least some of the formal rationale behind the strategy of our, behind our budget proposal as Chair of Strategy and Resources, I'm pleased to now have this opportunity to make some comments on this budget as a Liberal Democrat and as a firm believer in a more compassionate and collaborative politics. It has been a huge privilege and it remains a great pleasure to lead the new joint administration at this council, working with councillors across three political groups in a spirit of trust and support. This has been a big change from the attitude of the administration for the past four years. Bringing this budget forward from the Strategy and Resources Committee with a balanced budget presented with time for public scrutiny demonstrates that cross-party working can be considerably less chaotic than the single-party chaos now being demonstrated in Downing Street. And it is a better model shown by the, than that shown by the previous administration who kept their budget proposals hidden in recent years. This budget reflects strongly the agreed priorities of the joint administration. At the centre is ensuring we can support the most vulnerable who rely on our services not only this year, but also for future years. The challenges facing social care are huge, 
and making sure we are able to meet those challenges is crucial for those who rely on us. However, we also know that many households will be struggling financially in the coming months under the twin burden of conservative national insurance tax rises and the rocketing f fuel and food costs due in part to Brexit. This is why the additional support we have made available by extending the Household Support Fund, free school meals vouchers and the rebate for care leavers are so important. The cost of living crisis is at the front of our minds this month following the announcement on fuel prices. But we must not lose sight of the climate crisis, which poses a slow, slower moving but ultimately far more serious threat to our communities. It is hard to overestimate the possible impact of global heating of over two degrees. This is why tackling climate change is a core part of these budget proposals. Moving to a net zero Cambridgeshire is something which will require action from all organisations and individuals. This is why our Just Transition Fund focuses on working in partnership with communities and other organisations. Together, we face difficult challenges with the impact of the pandemic still heavily present. Together, as a joint administration, we are determined to tackle those challenges and to move towards a greener, fairer and more caring Cambridgeshire. And I hope all councillors will feel able to support this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Singer. Councillor Machine. Can I go now, please? Thanks, Chair. Um, I would like to start, please, by paying tribute to all my joint administration colleagues in general, but to the Labour Group in particular. They stepped up to the challenge of administration in a way that is beyond my ability to describe in circumstances that are very, very challenging. And if you're going to hear the word challenging a lot in previous speeches and mine as well, um, it's a thesaurus failure on my part, but I can tell you it's an indication of the situation where we are. We have a very difficult legacy left by the previous administration that we have to deal with. And we have to acknowledge the challenging situation nationally. There are food and fuel shortages. The cost of living is rising. Bills are skyrocketing. National insurance is being hiked. And there are tax rebates being advertised by government as tax rebates when they are actually an instant discount followed by a long-term mandatory repayment levy. We have to also acknowledge the situation in Cambridge here. We have and have had for some time, very high growth in the Greater Cambridge area specifically, which has so far been unsupported by adequate infrastructure. We have a non-existent public transport network and no affordable houses for people to live in if they want to come here and take some of the new jobs that are being created all the time. And we have an ever-increasing north-south divide. We have to acknowledge that since 2010, the government has implemented a strategy of devol devolving the acts to local councils who have borne the brunt of cuts without respite and without support and who find themselves relying on taxation as the only means to stay afloat. And we also have to acknowledge at this point that central government is only half of the reason why we're struggling today the other half being made up of a previous combined authority mayor who neglected the infrastructure of the area while pursuing his own vanity projects, and a conservative administration who buried their head in the sand about children and adult social care services and pretended we could transform the rise in demand of the ground out of existence. The county is now under new management. Things won't be looking up just yet, just because the adults are in charge, but we finally have a combined authority mayor who actually cares and is trying to turbocharge the skills agenda and the local transport and connectivity plan against the clock and a joint administration who actually also cares. Things won't be looking up just yet until this utterly embarrassing shower of incompetence is chased out of Downing Street. But until then, we will do our best and we pledge and we have pledged seven months ago, and we continue to pledge, a just transition to a net zero council by 2030, a focus on communities and their well-being, a focus on early prevention in care services rather than permanent crisis mode, a pursuit of the real living wage and how we can all benefit from it, including our contractors. All of this and more 
is the spirit in which our first business plan has been presented. And I look forward to discussing it in more detail in the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Sanderson. Thank you, Chair, and congratulations on your uh, new appointment. I know you'll, in, you'll enjoy it and you'll be very good. We're proud in the independent group to have played a role in helping to draw up this budget, which puts our residents' well-being and our environment at the heart of what it seeks to do. It will mitigate the social problems we've all experienced in our divisions due to the pandemic and austerity program from central government. The Just Transition Fund, which appears to have come in for some criticism in certain quarters, is a recognised way to fund schemes and projects that will bring services closer to the community. We're expanding the Care Together programme, providing care services closer to where people live. The Conservative Amendment today mentions flooding, but this budget will allow us to increase flood prevention, continuing a recent rapid increase in gully clearing throughout the county, which had fallen into neglect under the last administration. It will widen opportunities for the most vulnerable in our society, and this is a key point in our joint administration agreement. And I'm pleased to see that uh, children with special educational needs and disabilities will be a key priority in this budget. Our colleagues on the Children and Young People's Committee should be proud of the initiative they're proposing for young people leaving the care system, who could soon get a helping hand under the, under the proposal to grant them 100% council tax relief up to the age of 21. In addition, this budget proposes the creation of a discretionary targeted support fund for those young people leaving care who may need additional support as they move into independent living up to the age of 25. So with this support, young people leaving, leaving the care system will be able to independently manage their financial commitments as they go forward into employment, education or training. During the public consultation about our spending priorities, it showed firm public support for helping people leave, live more independent lives, tackling, tackling inequality and responding to the climate crisis. These match the priorities as set out in our joint agreement. But we must continue our work towards a balanced budget. We've done this, that this year and we must do so during the duration of the financial strategy. There was a forecast budget gap of £86 million by 2027 when we took office in May. And let us not forget what the peer review group said about this. They said it was an issue of significant magnitude for us. There will be an extra charge of one pounds four pence per week for a band D property and one pound 19 for a band C household, which is where more than half the homes in Cambridgeshire sit for council tax banding. But as well as the concerns expressed by the peer review group about historic decisions not to increase council tax, our district councils, including those run by Conservatives, have had to take a similar decision to protect the essential services for vulnerable people that they run. Our plans also offer support for those in need, like the Household Support Fund, which I'll cover um, when I talk about the Communities Committee. And we also continue to fund free school meals to eligible children throughout the school holidays. So finally, Chair, as we know, Cambridgeshire received the same level of funding if Cambridgeshire received the same level of funding as, average, as an average county council, we would have received an extra £23 million for the new financial year. So we need to continue our fight to get fair funding and lobby our members of parliament, especially those with new jobs close to the centre, centre of government, for a better deal for Cambridgeshire. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sanderson. Councillor Count. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I must tell you I was surprised by the sheer quantum and degree to which this administration would try and spin facts, hide evidence and avoid scrutiny in order to lead members of the public into believing a maximum tax increase was necessary. A complete and absolute fallacy. Comments such as this, council's chiefs, no option other than ma maximum tax hike. The fact is, our amendment shows that to be untrue. So let us be clear from the outset, we firmly object to their proposal of a maximum tax increase with virtually the entire general tax increase of £6.85 million being unnecessarily used just to put into reserves. No doubt we will hear how, how proud they are of what they have achieved, yet the truth is, within one year, of theirs taking over is already a record of manipulation, 
failure and chaos. In the budget, they talk of protecting services, yet what they have already been doing is to have a budget and simply not deliver the services they already had the money for. For example, they claim they will invest in climate change, yet the truth is £300,000 was allocated at the start of this financial year, and not one pound, not one penny is to be spent. It remains completely untouched. On highways, new scheme development of £454,000 was allocated, yet not one new scheme started or considered for 21-22. Money that could have been used to make our roads safer, yet in all of Cambridgeshire they could not find one new scheme to improve highway safety. They've kept £2.3 million of public health funding sitting in the bank vault like a nocturnal creature hiding from the light of day. Whilst a pandemic of epic proportions tragically swept through the people of Cambridgeshire. In fact, this year, their failure to deliver services since they took charge, I now predict, or we now predict, or is now predicted, to be over £16 million. Some of which they've already squirrelled away into reserves during the middle of the year. That, Chair, is a cut to services. Their first actions was to cut meetings where there was any chance of scrutiny, even deprioritising public health during a pandemic, trying every method possible to stop anyone from legitimately holding them to account. The chaos that has ensued, the lack of transparency, the decisions, as we heard more today, being made behind closed doors have been well evidenced. The hemorrhaging of staff, of which we heard more of today, has been evidenced for all to see. And the profligate spending without a care for the impact on a Cambridgeshire County Council taxpayer should shame them all. Yet they will smile and tell you loudly they are proud of their record and they will say they are not cutting services, not curtailing scrutiny, not a coalition of chaos. Sadly, they already have, they do, and they most certainly are. We therefore reject their budget proposals, we reject their claims of achievements, and we reject their costly but limited aspirations. Instead, we have put forward a credible conservative amendment, one which seriously tackles flooding, stops them paying off debt with money meant for highways, and rejects taxation unnecessarily destined for already ample reserves. An amendment which quite simply taxes less but delivers more. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Count. Under item five of the order of debate, we're now going to debate all sections of the business plan. All members will have the opportunity of speaking only once for five minutes. I propose as part of the main debate to exercise my discretion and to invite the chairs of the policy and services committees, if they so wish, to speak first. But before we start the main debate, I propose to take amendments at this stage. There is one amendment which was circulated electronically to members on the 2nd of February 2022 and published on the Council's website. Can I start by inviting Councillor Count to move the Conservative amendment? Yes, I, I do so move. Would you like me to start now, uh, Chair? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, there are three specific items on this amendment. Short and sweet to make it credible, deliver more and tax less. We have not used it to reverse your optional expenditures, which do little or nothing for service delivery and come to over £24 million, nor to reverse your other cho choices to pursue start-stop policies that burn through £20 million of one-off funding, then simply stop being delivered in the pretense the job is somehow finished and done. It is your choice today to widen the budget gap by £45 million, and that will be your own undoing. Our amendment cannot stop you or undo the damage you do. However, we can point these matters out and show everyone your fin financial naivety and politically driven decision making. Instead, our amendment focuses on three key, key areas. There is no need to increase general council tax by the maximum amount simply to put in general, into general reserves. We know the quote you are using from the section one by one officer, but use all the quotes, like the quote on page 20, 274. We, by we, we mean the County Council, retain substantial other reserves that, while earmarked, 
are not necessarily fully committed to expenditure. Or another approved quote, we also retain £40 million of earmarked reserves in 2022-23, much of which it may be possible to redirect and bolster the general reserve if needed. Not only that, the underspend for this year is now known to be in excess of £11.2 million, which automatically will put £4 million into general reserve for your consideration next year. Our second proposal is don't use pothole money from central government to pay off debt, as you have indicated on page 210. We propose any extra money for highways should be ring-fenced to be used to improve our highways, cycleways and footpaths for its original intention and not to pay off debt. We've already forced you into one turn on this, that this year when you slashed £4.2 million from the highways budget. Don't make the same mistake again that you did in the July SNR committee. And lastly on flooding, whilst you talk a lot about it, let's be honest, your inadequate proposal of £75,000 is insufficient what is needed and is needed now. Checking water courses, talking to communities and asking residents to put rainwater butts under their drain pipes is very welcome. But let's get real. Talk to those residents affected by flooding that the subject of the reports, such as those in St Neots or March. Your allocations in this area to compared to want compared to what is needed, are like a tartan blouse with a polka dot skirt. They simply don't match. Instead, we ask you to support our amendment and put £100,000 towards much needed flood modelling and £4 million into a matched capital fund. The Environment Agency and Anglian Water, amongst others, already operate this model. And together with matched funding, this could deliver £12 million of much needed Structural flood defences. Your £75,000 will not be sufficient for the people that get flooded. We heard earlier on about the rapid increase in gully clearance, and you will be pleased to note that this was due to the £1.6 million that the Conservatives put through the budget last year. For this year, a budget that you voted against and now claim credit for today. Don't make the same mistake again with flooding. If you vote against this amendment, your pretense that you care about highways will be shown for the transparent lines will know you are not serious about flooding. This is a serious, if you vote against this amendment, you'll be voting to put up tax, not because you claim it's needed, but because it is your political belief. This is a serious and credible Conservative proposal. It delivers more and taxes less. I ask you all to support it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Count. Do you have a seconder? I'm happy to second, uh, Chair, and reserve my right to speak. Thank you, Councillor Bowden. Um, I've, uh, Councillor Beckett has indicated. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Joint Administration Leadership, for all the work you have done in putting together a fair, clean, green, and yet inclusive and balanced budget. This may be my first year as a councillor, but I'm proud of the work we have been doing to turn around the county and to reverse years of poor political leadership. I'm sure you'll hear more later about the work in highways where we've inherited a department in managed decline, a department which caused flooding by not only not clearing the gullies, but by not even knowing... Excuse me a second, Councillor Machini. Oh, I'm, I'm really sorry. I was just A, asking if anybody could hear the beeping and B, asking if I can speak. <laughs> yes, um, Not sorry. now, later, okay, whenever thank it's you. my turn. Sorry, Councillor Beckett, continue. <laughs> no problem. A department which caused flooding by not only not clearing the gullies, but by not even knowing where they were. As a side note, I don't think I've ever come across another council where we've had to equip officers with metal detectors to find out where the gullies were. This is due to poor political management and asset tracking. It's ridiculous. A department where members of the opposition have put forth full council motions suggesting variations in highway quality between areas but with no way to quantify or to, or to validate. To put it frankly, the previous administration had been steering the ship into seriously dangerous waters. 
I'm proud of the extra money we're putting into road safety, proud of the work we're doing to improve management, to map our network, to utilize our assets, to get the most out of some dreadful contracts we've inherited. I'm proud of just how hard we have turned the rudder, even if it would take many years to turn the ship. Reading the Conservative budget amendment before us today, I was shocked at the contents and the quality. I know as parties we disagree at times on ideology, on priorities, on whether to cut tax or cut services, on who exactly should benefit and who should pay. When I opened the document, I was expecting to find just this, a well thought out, implementable budget which differed in ideology but was difficult to vote against. Instead, what we have here from the Conservative leadership's budget is magic money tree territory. The voted budget proposal can be summarised as raise less money, spend the same, raid the reserves and take out a Wonga loan. A budget which would be reckless to implement, but luckily doesn't have to be implemented as they're in opposition. A cynical budget, simply for electioneering. A budget which would leave your children, who are already in debt to their eyeballs and facing catastrophic climate change, with yet more debt and insecurity. Voting against this amendment today is easy. We have some incredibly intelligent, articulate and able councillors sitting in opposition. And I truly mean that. Theology is hard to argue against. Disappointingly, that is not this year, and I shall be certainly voting against this amendment. Yes, as an administration, we will raise council tax, but we will do it to improve the lives of Cambridgeshire, to improve road safety, to protect the environment, to help those most at need, and we shall do it without mortgaging our children's futures or putting services at risk. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to make three points about the Conservative amendment. Firstly, about balancing the books. Secondly, about highway maintenance. And the third, about the comments Councillor Count made on investment in flood management. Firstly, reducing the general reserve from 4% to 3% and increasing the budget gap in 2023-24 by £5 million to £24 million is unwise. Reserves are needed for a rainy day. Chipping away at reserves fails, risks failing to meet our statutory obligations or even go bankrupt, as happened in Tory-controlled Northamptonshire. We could, should be considering a longer-term financial plan, but we only have a one-year government settlement. So it is definitely not sensible to be planning to increase the budget gap even more. Secondly, on highway maintenance, the elder colleagues amongst you will remember that back in 2012, Cabinet agreed a proposal I presented to invest an extra £90 million over six years to an introduce an asset management approach to highway maintenance and improve the highway's contracts and supervisory procedures to increase value for money. The investment was completed, but I don't see much benefit coming from it. Our roads and gullies are still appalling. Our priority now must be to make better use of the money we do have to improve the value of mo for money we have. £4.1 million in flood protection measures to be taken from the Just Transition Fund. Councillor Nessinger has already said that in its first year, the Just Transition Fund will fund schemes that increase flood prevention, including a rapid increase in gully clearing. Recently, in my division, gully pots have been cleared after years and years of inaction, but the sewers themselves are still blocked, causing flooding. We need to use the fund to deal with these and other flooding problems across the country, as already proposed by the Joint Administration. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor van der Ven. Thank you, Chair. The Conservative record on highways maintenance doesn't inspire confidence in me, I'm afraid. Over the past several years, I've become accustomed to tiptoeing around my villages, having to explain to one exasperated resident after another that, sorry, no, we no longer have an annual gully clearing program. And sorry, no, we don't check on pavement and road repair jobs we've commissioned and paid for. We just don't have the resource. And sorry, but the council has considered the abysmal state of its roads, paths, and drains, and concluded that it will never get on top of it. In a speech in the council chamber at Old Shire Hall, the then chair of highways referred casual, casually 
to the Council's policy of managed decline, which is what it says on the tin. He seemed to imply that while the state of roads, paths, and drains will gradually get worse and worse, don't worry, we're aware of it, and we even have a policy name for it, so that is okay. The term managed decline, describing a policy of strategic abandonment, has fascinating and tragic roots, and there's plenty to read about it, including in the context of Liverpool following the riots of 1981, when it was articulated by Geoffrey Howe, Chancellor and Margaret Thatcher's cabinet. Then, as now, sharp differences emerged over the policy, and no wonder. Cambridgeshire's new joint administration has abandoned the policy of managed decline, which has left a shocking legacy in every community. It will take a long time to turn it around, but thank goodness we have leaders with the ambition and guts to make a start. And I'd like to pay special tribute to Councillor MacDonald. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dupre. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to uh, address two uh, items, two particular issues in the Conservative Budget Amendment, or as I like to call it, Steve Count's Big Book of Fairy Tales. The first of these is flooding, and the second is council tax. I want to welcome the support from the Conservative benches for our proposed extension of the Community Flood Action Programme. The program was established as a one-year project in April last year, and we are delighted to be able to confirm its continuation in our budget. Flood prevention and managing flood risk require cooperation between this council, residents, and a significant number of other bodies, including the Environment Agency, Anglian Water, representatives from the local Resilience Forum, District Council's internal drainage boards, and Highways England. Most spending on flood defence has historically come not from this council, but from those and other partners. I will speak more about this in the main debate, but for now, suffice it to say that, as we have already said when we launched the Joint Administration's new £14 million Just Transition Fund, one of the key purposes of that fund is to support shared work with our partners on flood prevention and tackling the climate emergency. It's there to be drawn down as needed on the basis of business cases presented to the Council for its consideration. This flamboyant Conservative amendment is therefore completely unnecessary. I said I also wanted to address the issue of council tax. As government financial support for local authorities has been cut, councils have had to turn increasingly to council tax to help plug the funding gap and keep services going. Indeed, government actually expects us to do so and includes council tax increases in the increased spending power it keeps telling councils it's given us. We are all acutely aware of the current pressures on household budgets. Far from the promise that after Brexit we would see cheaper fuel for our heating and hot water, £350 million a week for the NHS and cheaper food in the shops, Residents across the UK are facing frankly terrifying utility bills, a 9% rise in national insurance, and an onslaught of food price rises. In Finland, let's talk about Finland, residents can expect an average increase in their energy bills of £600 this coming year. Remove the £150 discount for homes in bands A to D and the government's enforced £200 loan, and that's still a rise of £4.80 a week. A man on the average Finland male salary will also pay around £4.80 a week more in national insurance this coming year, and a woman on the average Finland female salary will pay over £2 a week more. And while inflation is quoted officially as 5.4% or thereabouts, this grossly underestimates the real cost of inflation for people with the lowest incomes. Prices of value product ranges in supermarkets have soared. Rice, for example, has increased from 45p to two pounds per kilo in the last year, a 344% increase while the number of value products on the shelves has shrunk. Huge credit for exposing the real levels of inflation for poorer households goes to campaigner Jack Munro, whose Vimes Boots Index of the real cost of inflation for low-income families has been picked up by the Office of National Statistics, who are now considering how to present inflation figures more realistically. 
When government punishes lower-income families like this, no one relishes adding a council tax increase to residents' burdens. But the financial situation we have inherited from the group opposite is dire. The joint administration is proposing an additional £1.19 a week in council tax for those living in Band C homes. The group opposite supports three-fifths of this increase. The point of difference is therefore the remaining two-fifths, 48p a week. But nearly two-thirds of residents in Fenland live in Band B or Band A homes. That 48p a week will be 42p a week at Band B, 36p a week at Band A. And for those with single-person discounts or local council tax relief, the increase will be even less. And we have done our best to compensate lower-income households with our household support fund and commitment to free school meal vouchers in school holidays. While protecting many lower-income families from the worst of the council tax increase, we will therefore, at the same time, be more likely to be able to protect the council services on which they rely as we continue to work to resolve the horrendous financial situation we were bequeathed by the previous administration. That's fairness in action. By contrast, the Conservative amendment makes the budget gap in future years even worse and puts council services at greater risk Time's for residents up. who Time's need up, them Councilor most. Dupre. Time's up. Councillor Meschini. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have to say, the whole... The Conservative amendment, I was actually quite staggered and amazed on, on, on quite a few levels, and I... I, I, I still don't know where to start, and I'm about to start, so I have to say something, so forgive me for that. Um, right, so it is usual for the opposition to disseminate clues, right, during the year as to what the themes of their budget amendment will be based on the campaigns they launch and the motions they propose throughout the year. And based on that, I thought I was doing my homework <laughs> by preparing for an amendment that in the event does not seem to have materialised. Um, so here are some of the clues that I had picked up about what I thought was going to happen. Uh, July 2021, uh, Councillor Tierney proposes a motion to allocate 6.3 million from the overall revenue underspend in 2020-2021 to the highways budget, and he had a list of divisions in which he wanted that money to be spent, uh, as the list included my division, I remember. Uh, November 2021, Councillor Goldsack proposes a motion on a flood audit and, and report which officers estimated would cost us £7 million in capital investment over three years. Also November 2021, Councillor Hoy campaigns to retain the capital investment for a new school in Wisbeach in the capital programme, despite the commitment from central government that they would build a school. £25 million capital investment at an ongoing revenue cost of about a million a year over the MTFS. Now, what on earth were these? if not part of a budget narrative. Were they just, I don't know, were they just making random points at random times? Um, is this what the opposition thinks about the residents that are impacted by these proposals? Are they political footballs? If so, if that is the message that I'm sure it has been received. So what is actually in this amendment that we can talk about right now? Eight million unidentified revenue savings, more than our budget to find over the MTFS, seven million of which in year two. An extraordinary claim in the preamble, whilst we disagree, and I'm quoting, whilst we disagree with the blatantly profligate way the joint administration have spent and allocated one of funding, we have not sought to alter any spending plans at this stage. Simply we state we would have done things differently. Now, Cambridgeshire residents aren't even political footballs to this opposition. They are an afterthought. They aren't worth doing the work. I thought last year's budget, when the administration put all their spending into highways with no consideration for any other service area, was extraordinary. And this doubles down. They say a fish rots from the head, but it's obvious that as far as Cambridgeshire is concerned, the rot has well and truly spread from a criminally incompetent Tory party nationally down to this vicious, lazy opposition. Thank God we've got our residents covered. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor MacDonald. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to first of all uh, address head on and specifically some of the uh, claims that are in the Conservative Amendment with regard to highways. And I do appreciate the, the comments made by colleagues in, in the Joint Administration. 
First of all, in the Conservative amendment, it talks about proposed slashing of £4.2 million, pounds, and that that was somehow a, a U-turn that the joint administration um, performed. A, a U-turn, by the way, is when a Prime Minister comes to a dispatch box and says one thing and the following week says something completely different. That's a U-turn. As we've said repeatedly in highways, we answered Councillor King's question that came to committee uh, before Christmas about the 4.2 million. We answered that again in this hall at the Extraordinary Council, that the 4.2 million is embedded in our budget. There has been no changes to that since that was uh, made and ratified at Chair, earlier. Chair, point of personal explanation. Yes, Councillor Cameron. Thank you, Chair. Um, in the budget amendment that I mentioned, it was not the £4.2 million about the initial year's capital and revenue reverse spending that was in your budget. It was the £5 million addition to the capital spending uh, that went in, in between the two budget elements, which was the U-turn. So let's not conflate the two issues, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, secondly, Chair, on the uh, uh, money that... Uh, or, or the funds, the so-called pothole fund, which, which of course is very, very important for all councils, including ours. We have assumed the same level of grant funding for highways maintenance in 22-23 as the council received the previous year. And the joint administration is really clear that we're prepared to meet that spend commitment through council borrowing if necessary. We hope it doesn't come to that. Um, and thirdly, there is no ambiguity in the position as a Conservative amendment lays out. The only uncertainty is how the funding we will receive to government, how much funding we will re receive from government, and when we will find that out. We hope that's imminent, but as it stands at the moment, we don't know that. Whatever grant were allocated, whether it's more or less than expected, will be open and transparent, as we have been before, going to the Strategy and Resources Committee when the time comes to reach a decision. There are other aspects on highways I'd like to address in the main debate. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Howitt. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, uh, I was interested by Councillor Count's suggestion that the Joint Administration was avoiding scrutiny. Can we just recall that last year the budget proposals were not published at the for the full Council, but for the full Council itself, precisely to avoid scrutiny? Uh, and I'm delighted if now he's in opposition, the leader of the opposition suddenly finds that there's an interest in scrutiny, but his criticism would be uh, uh, more serious if, they, if we didn't have to uh, move to significantly increase the openness and democracy of the council, and we're doing it in this very way to enable this debate to happen in the first place. Secondly, on the Conservative amendments, aim to go below the waterline on council tax, even though that was uh, criticised by the peer review group, all party, that visited our council. When their amendments say that they put income and efficiencies above council tax increase, um, uh, that's what they, they want to say. What I say is that we put all three together, and as a joint administration, we will always levy the minimum council tax that we are forced to levy, and we do so again. Uh, we do so this year, but not at the expense of cutting services or of not taking fis fiscally prudent decision. That council account is our political to be to be belief. We have been forced to be more prudent because we've inherited that 80 million black hole of funding over four years, because we've inherited a council from you which is the second most indebted county council in the country, because we inherited reserves at the, at the minimum possible level, and because this council under the Conservative administration failed in their investments as we've seen in the searing indictments in the report on this land recently published. And, of course, the previous Conservative administration uh, 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 stewarded a period in which there was an £80 million reduction of revenue support grant from the Conservative government. The Conservatives do want to force down the reserves even further. They say we're blatantly profligate. I say they were blatantly irresponsible. In two of the four years of the Conservative administration, they overspent uh, the budget, eating into what were already the minimum level of reserves. And they want to push those irresponsible policies on this administration. They will not succeed. Chair. The simple Chair. truth... Councillor Kemp. Point of personal explanation. Thank you, Chair. We've heard it twice today that the amendment is about us 
putting down the, general, uh, the increase in the general reserves. What I said, and what is quite clear from our amendment, is there is no need to increase general reserves, which is what you are doing, and the documentation shows that the policy, the policy change is, as your budget puts it, is from 3% to 4%. So it's not us putting it down, it is us saying you shouldn't put it up. General reserves, council tax should not be used in this year just to put it into uh, general reserves. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Howitt. I'm not sure what the personal explanation was in that, but nevertheless, what Councillor Count heard at the Strategy and Resources Committee and sees in these papers is that our own Chief Financial Officer says that the, the reserves are at the minimum level necessary to face the risks that are facing this council. We are not prepared to put council services or the council taxpayers' money at risk. And it's the irresponsibility of the uh, previous Conservative uh, opposition that did indeed drive reserves below that minimum level. Uh, next, affordability. As my colleague Councillor Dupre has, has uh, very articulately said, our council tax of £62 per year should be put against £600 increases in people's energy bills, £226 increases in people's national insurance bills, and if it, you're a universal credit uh, claimant in Cambridgeshire, a cut in your benefits of £1,020 per year. If one other count Conservative councillor speaks in this debate and says that they oppose those uh, increases that have been put on Cambridgeshire residents by the Conservative government and that they apologise for what their party has done, then, uh, then I will take seriously their criticisms over the council tax increase. But unless they do so, their criticisms ring hollow. And finally, Chair, the Just Transition Fund. My, uh, described in their amendment as money sitting idle, unquote, from Conservative councillors, who who, some of whom recently were council tax deniers and, and who regularly Chair. vote against... <laughs> Chair, Councillor Count. I'm being misquoted again. I'm being misquoted again. I'm going to have to say the point about the money sitting idle was the £7 million at the end of four years, not about the entire Just Transition Fund. That is in the budget papers. There's unallocated money in the Just Transition Fund. I did not say that the Just Transition Fund was money sitting idle. I said the seven million pound, the four million pounds can come from the seven million pounds that is sitting there idle. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that explanation, Councillor Howitt. They don't like to hear the truth. Read their amendment and read those words uh, in their amendment. And their members vote against our policies uh, towards net zero within the Environment and Green Investment Committee. This year, last October, the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Independent Commission on Climate Change said that, that this county needed £700 million annually to transform our businesses, our homes and our energy systems to, to decarbonise them to meet net zero targets. For us, creating, a, creating a, a, a fund of around £14 million is a mere fraction of what is needed, but it's what we can do as a council, and it will make a significant uh, difference. When they say they want to put more money into flood management, that's the consequences of climate change. It's not dealing with the causes. And this council will pursue a just transition. That's time, Councillor Howitt. Thank you. And I, I thank you for listening to those remarks. Thank you. Next up is Councillor Goldsack. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll try and keep it brief. Just a few points. Uh, Councillor Massini, uh, I apologise, Machini, raised a point as to why we raised, I raised uh, a uh, motion last November, it was, early November. Uh, well, funny enough, uh, Councillor Machini, uh, Deputy Leader, um, that was seconded by Councillor Dupre, that motion. <laughs> and quite frankly, that motion, I last week wrote to the head of services asking them for progress. And do you know what I've had from reply so far? Nothing. Nothing has been done for Mr and Mrs Pryke, our resident, my resident in Soham, who came to us and asked what can be done to stop my house flooding. And we found out it was narrow gauge pipework. So uh, on that one, I find that quite uh, interesting. The second point I'd like to raise is this continual focus by this administration on central government. The reason we bring motions like that is because we are focused on our residents, not on the shenanigans or whatever 
political goings on that's going on in Westminster. Now, I won't apologise for everything that's going on up there because I'm focused on delivering for my residents. Last night, I was at Island Parish Council. Island, for those that don't know, is A, that's how it's pronounced, and B, is a small Fenland village in East Cambridgeshire. This is what they asked me last night. Why have we got no white lines on the road crossing in front on Mill Street? Why is there potholes in our pathways? Why is there planned resurfacing that's now been descheduled? And I speak to the local highways engineer, and what does he tell me? Got no money until the new year. Nothing will get done. That's what he's telling me. That's what his bosses are telling me. Now, what I'm saying here is, please, 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 administration, I will say there are things in your budget that I'm very pleased to see. OK? I will say that. But what I will not say is, after the mathematics, after the maths lesson from Councillor Dupre, most welcome, and most of our residents in East Anglia have experienced remote learning, so how pleasant to be in a room and get a maths lesson at the same time. Very well done. But actually, the bottom line is, that 47, 48p, or whatever it was that was the difference in your three-fifths model over two-fifths of what we're comp uh, complaining about, is fundamentally on top of everything else that you said and is unnecessary, you're taking money out of the pockets of the residents of Cambridgeshire and putting it into the bank account of Cambridgeshire County Council, and it's just not required. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ray. Thank you. So this motion proposes we reduce the council tax, uh, uh, as Councillor Goldsack has just said, by nearly £7 million pounds instead of raising it... Uh, uh, we reduce the reserves by nearly £7 million instead of raising the council tax uh, by 4.99%, an amount not unprecedented, as the tax was raised by this amount in two of the last four budgets, both prior to the pandemic. We are increasing the reserves because we know a storm is coming. Inflation is rampant and unpredictable. The projected deficits for 2023-24 uh, are very much worse than this year where additional provision from COVID has lent us some limited credit. This exemplifies the approach of the previous administration, as stated in their motion. It has always been conservative policy to seek efficiencies and extra income rather than increase council tax. Let's explore what this really means. Why is the projected deficit higher in these coming years? The council, quite properly, borrows money to invest in infrastructure over the long term as the minimum revenue position, provision. But the previous administration used this fund to set up the transformation fund to remove assumed inefficiencies. Inefficiencies which have been hunted to extinction over the last 30 years. When the trickle of possible investments dried up, the fund was converted into income. It is the paying back of this borrowed money which is adding to the deficit in the next few years. A reserve of 4% is entirely right in the current volatile economic climate, and indeed benchmarks low for a county council. You can only spend your reserves once. It's the equivalent of borrowing on your credit card to fund your groceries. It may help you this month, but next month you'll still need to buy groceries and will also have to pay off the debt. This strategy is echoed in the government policy for the fuel crisis, £200 instant credit to be paid back over five years in the vain hope that things will get better. This, ocean, this motion owes more to Wonka than it does to the so-called party of sound money. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tierney. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I can only imagine what somebody tuning into this and listening to the political ping-pong bouncing back and forth must think. Um, and I can't really speculate, but I'm sure that those few people that have wasted their time much better spent out in the sunshine, I would say, listening to this must be very disappointed. Um, I'd like to first answer a couple of things that where I've been mentioned or sort of side mentioned. And Councillor Machini mentioned my motion last year. If Councillor Machini thinks that my motion is going to be uh, leading into clues about the budget proposals, she perhaps misunderstands my place in the Conservative Party over this side. Um, <laughs> And uh, but, uh, what I tried to do with that motion, of course, was just to look after my residents, and not just mine, but residents of other areas of people where they are 
perhaps um, disserviced otherwise, who don't have as much money as others, and I did hope I'd get support, and I didn't. And, and this leads me on to my point, which is that um, I've been a councillor for quite a long time now, first served on this council about 12 years ago, and I remember back then the Labour Party were quite different, because back then uh, a conservative like myself with working class roots, a bit of a libertarian bent, would find quite a lot of support on the Labour benches, and uh, I often found things they said to be pertinent and interesting and I could support them, but things have really changed. And, and I just can't imagine how the Labour Party now can, can present the positions they do. I'm not surprised about the Lib Dems. They've never seen a tax rise they didn't love. I'm not surprised by the independents who just do what they're told. But I am surprised by the Labour Party because the people most hurt by eye-watering tax rises, the people most hurt are the people on the breadline. OK, there are people who don't pay council tax or don't pay much and are protected. And there are people who are wealthy and can grumble and moan but can absorb the increases. But it's those people, and there's a lot of them, a lot of them in all of our areas, who are really struggling and are facing rises from all sides. Now, I just want to come back to that, as Councillor Howitt, I think, said about no Conservative should speak on this. Well, I have opposed, um, uh, quite publicly, the potential uh, new national insurance rise and many other rises for all the same reasons I'm going to speak now. I don't hold one party in blame for this. I think all parties should bear in mind that there are lots of people out there who are really struggling. So when you deliver to them a massive tax rise, the most you can possibly give them, again, all they're going to do is look at it and say, you aren't, you aren't the party that care, which is what you claim. You're, you're the parties that don't care. You could not care less about them. That's the truth. You virtue signal, you nod through absolute nonsense just so you can prop up your reserves. You could not care less about them. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hoy. Yes, thank you. Um, I actually wasn't going to speak on this. I was saving it for the next part of the debate. But um, unfortunately, you've got Councillor Howitt to thank for my uh, intervention. No, I really wasn't. I actually genuinely wasn't. I've got a bit for later, but not for now. So uh, I'm afraid you spurred me. Um, mostly because of this cold council tax denier. I mean, I just think that's really funny because everyone, we always say about kind of gentler politics and then say any, anyone that doesn't agree with like a narrative we want to support is a denier of it. And I don't know if anyone denies council tax exists at all. Like, <laughs> We all pay it, as far as I'm concerned. I don't know anyone that thinks it's not a real thing that doesn't happen. So that was a little bit bizarre. But um, Also, I think uh, it, what, what Councillor Howitt said about national government actually is true. Um, I think it's a little bit ironic that we, the, the argument seems to be being made that we can't uh, get money from nowhere and so we have to tax people to spend for services. But that doesn't then seem to equate with national government who've just spent billions of pounds on a pandemic and have to find some way to pay for it. Now, it's absolutely regrettable for me that the reason they've, like, the reason they've done that and, and paying for it is with a national insurance rise. I'd have much rather they'd have cut services, but there we are. We are where we are with it. That's what they do. They spend, they spend, they spend, and everyone else has to pay for it. Um, I also find it an absolute disgrace to, to uh, ignore the real reasons for rising energy costs and loaning everyone, including millionaires, £200 that they have to pay back over five years. I, I think that is a disgrace. I'm not happy with that. And I'm more than happy to apologise uh, that national government sadly doesn't seem to have many real Conservatives in it. Thankfully, there are some very valiant Conservative MPs that realise you can't tax, spend and borrow away out of a crisis. Um, hopefully, eventually, one day they'll win. I'll keep my fingers crossed for that day. Thank you. Councillor Atkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so I had intended to engage with some of the comments made so far in the debate, um, but I do struggle with the um, accusations uh, levelled at this uh, budget through this budget amendment. Um, so one Conservative has said they welcome some of the spending commitments. Uh, another, however, that the spending plans are disastrous. Um, and in that context, I don't understand why the opposition has not come forward with a more substantial amendment for us to consider, where perhaps we might understand precisely which bits they agree with and which bits they don't. Um, some of the sentences in their amendment we have been lucky enough to receive uh, aren't even finished. Uh, we've been simultaneously accused of profligate spending and squirrelling money away and paying down debt all at the same time, which I find a little difficult to follow. I think this scattergun sort of paper-thin approach to opposition doesn't do a great service to the residents of Cambridgeshire. Now, whatever we might think 
um, about the national government, and we've heard a remarkable range of opinions already, it's clear from the latest levelling up white paper that Cambridgeshire is a long way from being a priority for this government. Um, the fact that significant inequality can persist within a wealthy city or across a wealthy city and county would seem to be beyond the comprehension of current government thinking. And as always, it's local government that's going to have to pick up the pieces. Uh, we've made it clear that we're not going to shy away from this task. Now, th the opposition would have us gamble the future on an imprudent level of reserves and a yawning budget gap in future years. And we'd be left totally at the mercy of a national government whose stated priorities lie far beyond our county. The most likely outcome would be cruel cuts to services in 12 months' time, just as families will be reeling from a year of squeezed incomes, higher inflation and economic uncertainty. This is not a risk I'm willing to entertain. <clears throat> this is an administration that will fight to protect and improve services for all residents of Cambridgeshire and in particular for those most in need. I'm proud to support the enhanced financial support for families in receipt of free school meals, young care leavers and children in need of additional support to rebuild their self-confidence and resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sharp. Thank you, Chair. Um, I support this amendment as it re removes an unnecessary increase in council tax. The increase of reserves from 3% to 4% does nothing for residents, some of whom have struggled through the pandemic and only increases costs to hardworking people. Residents care about a number of issues, but there are two areas that concern residents more than others, namely highway maintenance, including potholes and flood prevention. The administration proposal addresses neither of those. The Labour leader says that the council was left in a challenging position by the previous administration. That is far from the truth and far from 2010 when Liam Byrne announced that nationally, nationally that all the money had been spent. I am disappointed that the independent members have followed the tax to the max of Labour and Liberal Democrat members. The independent leader seeks to have us believe and states that it is unavoidable not to increase council tax and that includes Conservative councils. I am proud to be chairman of East Cambridgeshire District Council that has kept their portion of the council tax at a nil increase for eight years. And we've done that whilst maintaining public finances and maintaining services. The Labour leader mentioned that the new combined authority mayor was a breath of fresh air. Fresh air is all that we have from him. Currently, in nothing achieved, no policies, and a complete shambles of a, of a budget. That is what you get from a Labour mayor. I ask that members support this, su support this amendment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. I do not support the Tory budget amendment for a number of reasons, many of which have been aired already. But I would like to comment in particular on the point about having reserves at 4% for next year and why the Tory plan to raid reserves and keep them at an unsustainably low level of 3%. Chair, point of personal explanation. We've already covered this ground. It is not us raiding, raising reserves. Our amendment talks about you not putting it up. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Thank you. I have made the point that uh, having reserves at 4% for 22 23 and why the Tory plan would be to raid that level of reserves and keep them at an unsustainably low level of 3% is not the right course and would put services at risk. Working at the reserves level is a judgment. It's a judgment about the need to ensure there is enough contingency and flexibility given the particular risks we face. The point is that if risks crystallise, or if there are changes, with the sensible level of reserves, we can weather these storms and protect services which many Cambridgeshire residents rely on. And we do face significant risks. The pandemic is not over. There is a shocking cost of living crisis. 
and the fallout from a disastrously botched Brexit. All of these mean that we could experience a big increase in demand for services in social care, for example, uh, sharply increased costs in supply of staff and services, or significant economic impacts which ultimately affect our income. The proposed medium-term financial strategy, therefore, sets out the risks and justification for a 4% level of reserves in 22-23. Without that contingency, there is no protection against risks. There is instead ad hocracy, lurching from crisis to crisis, from one cliff edge to another, plugging a gap for now, but creating problems next year and the year after. We need to ensure that council services are there for people who rely on them to address the climate emergency and to ensure we have a greener, fairer and more caring future for Cambridgeshire residents. Dipping into the reserves is all about plugging a gap for now, but having no regard for future consequences. Once reserves are used, they are gone. You cannot use them again. By raiding the reserves that we plan, the Tories would put the council services at risk. Thank you, Councillor Simon King. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yes, I, I, I do have a great deal of sympathy with Councillor Tierney's point that those people who are listening to us um, are perhaps not being, uh, making good use of their time. At heart, this is a very simple disagreement. It's whether to put up council tax by just under 2% and put it into reserves or not. That's what it's about. And I particularly want to bemoan the fact that nobody from the other side has given this side, the Conservative side, any credit for our support of adult social care. We have a very good record in putting additional funding into that. We're not opposing the additional 3%, and I think that's something we can be proud of, and indeed the people of Cambridgeshire can be grateful for. So it would be nice to have some recognition of that, rather than focusing upon what is essentially a difference between philosophy. And I strongly support keeping the council tax as low as possible while protecting the most vulnerable people in our community. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any other speakers on my list, so Councillor oh, Schumann. Thank you, Chair. I did indicate I hadn't realised I hadn't caught your eyes. Chair, I, I, I will be brief, as uh, this administration may be uh, able to forcefully take money from our residents, but I don't intend to take too much of their time. Uh, and quite frankly, we've seen time and time again that the whip among the leadership of this joint administration is so strong that our discussion seems somewhat futile. Having said that, I hope, nothing, uh, I hope that if nothing else, my comments might resonate with the public or with some of the members of the joint administration. In recent years, we have seen politicians talk about how our actions affect the lives of people rather than the remoteness that sometimes our decisions feel that they're taken in. I wish to refer to a young person who I've spoken to recently in uh, the area I represent. This young person has just moved to Cambridgeshire for uh, better employment prospects. During a brief conversation, it became clear that they had one aspiration in the coming years, and that was to own their own home. Perhaps not much to ask for. They told me how they would just about cover all of the costs of living uh, and live within their means, but also highlighted that nearly 8.5% of their taxed income is having to be spent per month on council tax. They told me that they would be delighted to put a little money aside and put it into a bank account, or we might call it reserves, in order to try and achieve their modest aspiration of one day owning their own home. Sadly, we are seeing today that the storm we've heard reference to, faced by so many of our residents, including this one I referred to, is not a concern or priority for the joint administration, but rather they prioritise squirrelling money away in Cambridgeshire County Council's bank accounts than rather than allowing our residents to do the same during what we've heard is apparently this storm that we're facing. Chairman, I said I'd be brief. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. No other speakers. I'm going to invite Councillor Bowden. 
Thank you very much indeed, Chair. I've listened to the debate with great interest, and sometimes it feels as though the administration just isn't listening to some of the comments which are being made. Uh, but I was particularly interested to hear the comments of Councillor Machini. Uh, and I'm very disappointed that, that we're not presenting the budget alternative that you wanted us to present or expected that we would present. But in fact, the truth is that if we had continued to be in power after last year's elections, we would currently be facing a very, very different budget from the one that we see in front of us today, even including our amendments. Because during the course of the last nine months, we would have continued ruthlessly to look for efficiencies within the organization. We would have continued to look for extra income to support the frontline services in the organization. And we most certainly would not be proposing an unnecessary council tax increase now. Moreover, we would not have made many of the politically inspired, financially imprudent decisions that this administration has made over the last nine months. So we'd be presenting something massively different from what we see in front of us today. What we have decided to do here, however, rather than produce a 300-page amendment to the budget, is to highlight four particular areas, highway maintenance, flood prevention, and council tax, which have been discussed at some length uh, uh, in this debate so far. Uh, Councillor Dupre talked about the financial inheritance which has been received, which she says is, and I'll use her words, I don't want to misquote her, dire and horrendous. And uh, Councillor Howard used the word black hole. Well, I'm very sorry, but this just doesn't reflect reality. When I joined this council in 2015, in very dark days, it has to be said, when there was no overall control, uh, I was appalled when I saw the size of the budget gap that faced us in the medium-term financial strategy. And it was only after 2017, when the Conservatives took power, that hard decisions were made, year in, year out, with a lot of hard work behind them, to ensure that the uh, budget uh, uh, gap that we had in the medium-term financial strategy was reduced. I'll be referring, Chair, to page 15 out of the 61 on today's agenda pack, if anyone's interested, because I'll be talking about some numbers in a second. Uh, so uh, to say that a black hole has been inherited is really quite a meaningless and incorrect comment to make, especially com when you compare it with the fact that the proposal of this administration is in fact to increase the budget gap over the next five to six years, uh, as opposed to what we gave as an inheritance to the new administration. And uh, uh, on page uh, 15 of 61, where we see the, uh, uh, the administration's proposed medium-term financial strategy, I think I need to point something out to Councillor Howard, which might be helpful to him. He said, and I hope I took the words down exactly correctly, and I'm sure he'll give a point of personal explanation if I didn't, but I took down that he said that the administration would ensure that there was minimum council tax that we have to levy each year. And fine, that they are fine words, but they're not consistent with what we see on page 15 to 61, where we see in the medium-term financial strategy that the administration is proposing within the MTFS, the assumptions within the MTFS, Instead of the assumption that council tax would increase 2% each year, it would increase by 4.99%, not just next year, but the year following, and the year following that, and the year following that, and the year following that. That's what the administration is proposing, and that doesn't seem to me to be completely consistent with Councillor Howard's comment that there would be the minimum council tax we have to levy each year, unless it is the political opinion of the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats that it's necessary always to, to, to uh, seek the highest possible legal increase without having a referendum, which appears to be the case. So, uh, Chair, I look forward to uh, seeing support for this, uh, this amendment. I particularly look forward to seeing support given the additional funds which we are talking about to tackle flooding in March and St Neots especially. And I'm sure that both March and St Neots councillors will be very keen to show their support for that additional funding. Uh, and I just need to finish by asking for your guidance, Chair, on a matter of procedure, which I'm sorry to say I'm not, I'm not uh, sure about. And that is, I'm very well aware that it is a legal requirement that there be a uh, recorded vote on the budget. Does there also need to be a recorded vote on an amendment? If there isn't, then I would like to ask for one. Yes, there has to be a recorded vote on the amendment, so then we'll, we will take a recorded vote, yes. That's much appreciated, Chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Nethsinger, would you like to sum up as a proposer of the original motion? Yes, please. This Conservative amendment is very short, but nonetheless is full of inaccuracies and misinformation. 
the rot starts at the second sentence. Contrary to what is stated here, there has been no attempt whatever to hide the information presented at the Strategy and Resources Committee. It is on the County Council website, twice, first from the Strategy and Resources meeting and again today. The list of factually correct information it would be possible to publish, along with the Council's business plan, is almost limitless. We know the Conservatives are keen to add all sorts of extra information to their papers. You only have to read the levelling up white paper. But to accuse the joint administration of attempting to prevent the public from seeing that information is simply untrue. The claims on the highway funding are equally spurious. As Peter has made clear, there is no slashing of 4.2 million by the joint administration, no U-turn, there has been no change in the Treasury management strategy. So the treatment of the government's maintenance grant has been exactly the same this year as it was under the previous Conservative administration. There is also no ambiguity about the use of any future government grant for highways maintenance. Conservative slurs that there is any question that government grant money for highways maintenance would be used for highways maintenance are the type of misrepresentation we have grown accustomed to from a party which seems to have an ever more distant relationship with truth or accuracy or expertise. One phrase I do agree with in this amendment is that Cambridgeshire is vulnerable to flooding. We will not, however, be taking any lectures from the previous administration on making that a priority. The administration who failed to check whether their contractor had cleared the gullies, whose neglect and penny-pinching approach left hundreds of Cambridgeshire residents facing flooding last winter, they have to answer to Cambridgeshire's residents on their record. Lorna and Graham have given full and thorough responses on, our, on the work that this administration is doing to tackle what is a growing threat to many in our county. We will, of course, be working closely with the Environment Agency and Anglia Water, but I fundamentally disagree that a community approach can only be regarded as a first step. I believe that our communities have incredibly valuable knowledge on where the risks lie, and our approach using the Just Transition Fund process will allow those communities to set the agenda rather than the top-down approach here. The key change in the Conservative proposals is, of course, the difference in their council tax rate. This is a serious matter, and again, their suggestion that we reduce the general reserve to 3% rather than 4 against the Chair, clear advice... Once, once again, point of personal explanation. We keep telling that we are not re uh, reducing. There's nothing in our amendment, nor anything that has been said about reducing the general reserve from 4% to 3%. Our amendment is to stop the joint administration from raising from raising the general reserve policy from 3% to 4%. I will not keep having this repeated in a, in a public record. Thank you. Kirsten Singer. Against the clear advice of the Council's Chief Financial Officer follows from years of misleading the public into thinking you can keep Council tax low without there being an impact on Council services. Three years ago, we were told the cuts to children's centre provision would not have an impact on the level of service. That was simply untrue, as thousands of young parents have found. Under the previous administration, the state of our roads has declined, the quality of our children's services went from good to requires improvement, the number of apprenticeships dropped, our bus services were cut, and our gullies were not cleared. After years of neglect and broken promises, the people of Cambridgeshire voted for change last year. This budget will help us to start to rebuild Cambridgeshire County Council, a Cambridgeshire County Council we can be proud of. We know that for some families the additional cost will be tough, but we are determined to make sure that support is there for those who are struggling this year through the money set aside in the Household Support Fund and the Free School Meals Voucher Scheme. Our neighbouring upper tier councils are also putting up council tax and are not making such clear efforts to support those most in need. I would like to respond to Councillor Schumann's comments. We would, of course, all want to support that young person's hope of owning their own home, but to suggest that a 50p a week difference, that with a 50p a week difference, they might be able to save enough to make a significant difference to that uh, um, ambition is really unfair and unrealistic. And it's as unfair and unrealistic as suggesting that young people should watch less Netflix in able to be able to afford their housing. We know we have huge issues with the cost of housing in this county, but let us not pretend that they can be fixed by a 50p a week change. 
This Conservative amendment is based on lazy assumptions, dangerous risks for future years and misinformation, and I have no hesitation in asking members of the Joint Administration to vote it down. Thank you. Thank you. So we're now going to move to the vote on the amendment. The Constitution requires that voting in relation to the annual budget setting, included motions and amendments, shall be by recorded vote. So can I therefore ask the Democratic Services Manager to conduct a recorded vote? Thank you, Chair. I'll read your surname and if you could then indicate how you wish to vote. Ambrose Smith. For. Atkins. Against. Batchelor. Against. Beckett. Against. Billington. For. Bowden. For. Bradnam. Against. Bulat. Against. Bywater. For. Connor. For. Corney. For. Costello. For. Count. For. Coots. Against. Cox Condren. Against. Daunton. Against. Dupre. Against. Ferguson. Against. French. For. Fuller. For. Gardner. For. Gay. Against. Giles. Goldsack. For. Goodliffe. Against. Goff. Against. Gowing. For. Hathorne. Against. Hay. For. Howe. For. Howitt. Against. Hoy. For. Kindersley. Against. Jonas King. For. Maria King. Against. Simon King. For. MacDonald. Against. Maguire. Miskini. Against. Mills. Against. Murphy. Against. Nasinga. Against. Prentice. For. Ray. Against. Sanderson. Against. Josh Schumann. For. Shayla. Against. Sharp. For. Slatter. Against. Smith. For. Taylor. Against. Thompson. Against. Tierney. For. Van der Ven. Whelan. Against. Wilson. Against. Chair, the result of the votes are 24 votes in favour and 32 votes against. No abstentions. The amendment is therefore lost. Thank you. It's now approaching quarter past 12. We're due to take a break at 12.30, but with your permission, I think we should move that forward by 15 minutes and take a 17-minute break until 12.30. So see you back here at 12.30. Thank you very much.
Members, could you please take your seat? It's Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, everybody. Right, we're going, now we're going to debate the main business plan, and I'm going to invite the chairs of the Policy and Services Committees to speak first, if they wish. Councillor Howitt. You nearly caught me napping there, Chair. Um, so I'm really proud of the budget that we brought forward of the Council and the Joint Administration as a whole, of course, but of the aspects relating to the Adults and Health Committee in particular. We do recognise that we are the um, uh, biggest spending of the committees. Uh, we have some of the biggest needs in terms of adult social, social care and public health. Uh, but we, this year, have worked hard as members and officers to get £10 million of savings as part of closing the budget gap, uh, five times the amount uh, that the committee achieved last year and the last year of the old administration. And I'd like to thank the officers as well as all the members of the committee for the hard work that has achieved that. This is also a COVID budget, as the leader of the council said earlier, uh, and we should be cognizant that as we speak, three of the top districts in the country for the greatest incidence of COVID are in, uh, are in Cambridgeshire. Uh, during the year, we, we won the uh, enhanced response area status for Cambridgeshire, and we made a significant difference in terms of vaccination rates. And I am sorry that the Conservative opposition today has shamefully repeated uh, its claim that public health monies have been unspent, when indeed our public health staff have been working so hard and the underspends are caused by the fact that they've been devoting themselves to, to attacking the, the COVID pandemic. This is a budget which will maintain the fight against the pandemic. It will deal with the backlog of demand of other services which will, will, will there, as well as the significant growth in demand for adult social care in population forecasts. Overall, we're investing 25 million pounds extra in, so, in social uh, care and health in the next year, both in the revenue budget in one-off expenditures and through the capital programme. We're investing £2.9 million in Care Together, a new neighbourhood-based approach to delivering social care, breaking up the big contracts uh, with uh, uh, big social care providers and having na smaller neighbourhood-based contracts, uh, more micro-enterprises, more cooperation with the voluntary community sector and more direct in-house provision by the council itself. Uh, to achieve more local, more caring and more responsive social care services. It's a major transformation of the way we provide social care. We also recognise that the years of low pay, low recognition for social care workers must end. Um, uh, we are uh, increasing pay and making care work a more attractive career option. Already we paid a half a million pounds to social care providers in the county this year extra, insisting that that money goes directly to care workers and, of course, a 20% increase uh, to some of our key, key social services, social care staff. And this budget is the beginning of a £6.3 million investment over three years, which will see every, one of, every social care worker getting a pay rise to meet the real living wage by the year 2027. We really do value our social care workers. 
We're putting an additional investment of £250,000 uh, into support for carers with counselling, wellbeing support and respite breaks, uh, which are so, so vital to them. We're expanding direct payments to people with disabilities and elderly persons who want to manage their own care packages. It's a 222,000 additional investment and we'll see 90 more people being able to manage their own care programmes next year compared with this. Cambridgeshire was 5% lower in the country for people able to ha have their own direct care packages and we're, we're addressing that difference. We're investing more money in the enhanced response service. That's where people have falls. Uh, and instead of having to call an ambulance and end up in hospital, we're getting there first and we're providing the help that stopped them having to go into hospital. It's a superb service. And for each year in the next four years, starting this year, we're going to invest uh, capital in a new independent living scheme uh, construction uh, in districts across the whole of Cambridgeshire, 49 unit um, housing, housing uh, units that are sort of halfway between sheltered housing and residential care that enable people to stay in their own homes uh, uh, but, but to, have the, to have their care needs gone. Finally, uh, Chair, the Conservative leader of Peterborough Council said that the council would do less in terms of social care and families had to do more. Well, we're doing more for families because we recognise the burdens that Cambridgeshire families suffer. But I look across the aisle towards the Conservative benches and I've heard Councillor Simon King say that the opposition supports adult social Let's care. time up, I'm afraid, Councillor Howitt. Councillor Howitt, Howitt say up. that she wants it cut. Thank you. I think they should clarify Thank you, Councillor Howitt. Time's up. Thank you. Councillor Dupre. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm going to start. Uh, it's, yeah, it's an enormous privilege to speak today as chair of this council's Environment and Green Investment Committee in support of this first joint administration budget. It's also a privilege to be able to speak on behalf of an administration that has put forward a competent budget. Councillor Sharp earlier sang the praises of East Cambridgeshire District Council, but I need to remind him in this meeting that the budget papers for that council's finance committee meeting proposed a £5 a year council tax increase, whereupon the leader of the council moved an amendment to delete the budget recommendations in their entirety, proving you don't need a coalition to have chaos. Our joint administration agreement committed us to work towards a greener, fairer and more caring Cambridgeshire. I believe firmly that our budget proposals today are a significant step on that journey. Flooding and the risk of flooding have been very much on the minds of Cambridgeshire residents, particularly since the events of December 2020. Much of that work sits in highways, but the Environment and Green Investment Committee also has a major role to play. I've already spoken today about the cooperation that's needed across public and private bodies to take effective action on flood protection. This spirit of cooperation is reflected in the draft local, local flood risk management strategy and its associated draft action plan with tasks assigned to many of those bodies. These documents have been issued for public consultation, comments have been received, and we are currently reviewing these prior to finalising the plan. Councillors from the group opposite will be involved in that work. And that cooperative spirit is also evident in the ongoing work of the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Flood and Water Partnership, which I chair. Now that the revised local flood risk management strategy is approaching completion, I've open, opened up discussion with other members of the partnership about the potential to refocus its work towards overseeing the schemes in the action plan. Shared planning and priorities will enable the best use to be made of every partner's resources, including our own. Our new £14 million Just Transition Fund will be a key part of this process. We've included £150,000 for the coming year in our budget to continue the Community Flood Action Programme beyond its initial year and allow this excellent initiative to expand, engaging more residents in working alongside us to protect their communities. During this year, I attended the first visit of the Floodmobile to the community of Alconbury Western, and on Thursday next week, I look forward to its visit to my own village of Sutton. Our joint administration agreement also undertook to look for ways to promote biodiversity and increase Cambridgeshire's natural capital. Cambridgeshire is one of the most biodiversity-deprived counties in the country. We inherited a commitment from the outgoing administration to a 20% biodiversity increase, but no baseline from which to measure it. 
we moved quickly in year to allocate £109,000 towards staff capacity, a biodiversity audit and site repairs. And we have now added £105,000 to the budget for the forthcoming year to develop the actions required for the biodiversity commitments in our climate change and environment strategy and to ensure the best biodiversity and natural capital benefits are gained from the Council's own public assets. We will also be funding an investigation into establishing an active parks, active parks unit within the Council. I've mentioned climate change. Our revised climate change and environment strategy was referred unanimously from the committee to this body, and I hope it will receive unanimous support here later today. Our budget includes commitments for this year and reducing sums for the two years after that to support the delivery of that strategy and help reduce carbon emissions on the part of the Council and of Cambridgeshire more widely. Our capital budget sees work progress on the many excellent energy schemes in Cambridgeshire, from those currently underway to those in their exploratory stages. Swaffham Prize Community Heat Scheme, Smart Energy at St Ives, Baverham, Trumpington, Energy Projects at Stanground and Woodston, Solar at North Angle and Fordham. Support to get schools and communities off oil and to improve the carbon efficiency of council assets and services. And continuing significant investment in decarbonising 69 council-owned and occupied buildings. All council buildings will be taken off fossil fuels and low-carbon heating solutions installed with investment expected to be recouped in full from savings delivered on the council's energy bills. This council also continues to work with the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authority on improving fixed and mobile internet connectivity. I also want to say a few words about the council's County Farms Working Group, which I chair and which reports into the Council's Strategy and Resources Committee. The budget reflects the hard work the farms team is doing in securing increases in rental income, along with capital investment at Lower Portland Farm at Burwell in particular and potential opportunities across the county. The County Farms team have had a challenging few years and I very much hope the Council corporately will continue to support them and recognise their valuable work. In conclusion, I'd like to thank the absolutely excellent officers who report to my committee. They've been, quite frankly, a joy to work with. And I would, of course, also like to thank my vice chair and independent lead member, councillors Nick Gay and Stephen Ferguson, and the members of the, of the Environment and Green Investment Committee for their commitment to this vital area of the Time's up, work. Councillor Dupree. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Can I invite the uh, chairs of any of the other policy and service committees to indicate if they'd like to speak? Mm -hmm. Councillor Goodliffe. Thank you, Chair. I'm delighted to be part of the joint authority here today and as chair of children and young people, I'm delighted that our children and families are at the heart of all we do, as shown by this budget. As well as our statutory duties, we're prioritizing, prioritizing children and families, their well-being, their health, their safety and their education. How, you may well ask. I will highway, highlight three ways. Our care leavers, our most vulnerable young people. Unlike their peers, they don't have the option of staying home once they reach 18. Currently, up to 53% of the most impoverished adults aged 20 to 34 do this in order to save, either for years or in a managed return between study or between jobs. Because of this, we are offering a full refund to our care leavers up until the age of 21. Just for clarity's purposes, this is a refund. This is a not a loan. It will not be repayable, either now or over the next five years. A fund will also be set up for our other care leavers, available to those in financial difficulty. A lifeline, similar to those which other parents would offer. A core part of how we, as the joint authority, view our responsibility for corporate parenting. We will continue to listen to our care leavers, their advocates, and to work with them to help them to achieve. Secondly, our free school meals commitment. According to Maslow's hierarchy of need, without addressing hunger, we cannot expect our children to achieve. Poverty, hunger, it all leads to lack of health, mental and physical, and a reduction in life chances. You may not like me mentioning across the, across the divide austerity, but the evil, evil legacy of austerity has led to a negligence and stain and a source of deep, deep shame. So we are proposing with this budget today that we will pay school, free school meal vouchers for our children at the age of two up until 19 for those who are on free school meals School, sorry, school holiday vouchers up until and including February half term next year. Our teachers and school staff regularly see fatigue, lack of concentration, hunger and poor physical health in schools. 
Our families have nothing left to cut. There is no option for them. We are seeking to redress this in part today. Inflation is currently at over 5%. However, Jack Monroe, author and food poverty campaigner, has shown that the inflation rate on the cheapest food items is more like 141%. Our food banks and hubs are seeing increases in visitors, and the level of need they are seeing is also greater. They have regular requests for items that do not require cooking, for example, due to poverty in fuel. This is why we prioritise continuation of our free school meal vouchers to cover these elig eligible children. And the third one I would like to mention is the Children's Catch-Up Fund. Working with our schools, colleges, nurseries and other agencies, we're putting funds to benefit children whose families are on universal credit, children who are identified as needing additional support, for example, in well-being. These activities may well and hopefully will be varied, including arts, music, sport, cultural and social skills, aiming to build these skills, self-confidence and resilience in our children, all of which have been damaged due to COVID. I apologise for the continuing issue. I know people would like to pretend it's over. Our absence rate in our schools is incredibly high, as it is across the country, and it is almost as high for staff. We are still not over COVID, and our recovery is longer and will continue. Our children and young people continue to amaze us with their ability to cope and maturity in the ongoing situation, and we thank them and want to work with them here today. I cannot mention COVID-19, nor indeed children's services and education, without also mentioning the amazing staff and families who go above and beyond to support, protect and educate in all they do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sanderson. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm pleased and proud to give members a flavour of what we've been doing on the Community's Social Mobility and Inclusion um, Committee, commonly known as, as COSMIC, and the work we've been doing in the past nine months where I've been so well supported by the team, including my Vice Chair, Councillor Cox Condren, and the lead spokes, Councillor Thompson and Councillor Criswell. We've worked collabor collaboratively um, over the past uh, few months and we've continued um, a lot of the good work that we've seen in previous years on this committee. Most recently, we've been helping thousands of our residents who urgently needed support to put food on the table and heat their homes. The Household Support Fund has been expanded um, to assist 29,000 residents on universal credit by giving them a one-off payment of £20 to help with the reduction in benefits that they've had from central government. We've helped many thousands of residents in Cambridge here since the fund was rolled out, and I must also pay tribute to our community connectors, as well as our colleagues at the city and our district councillors who've helped to roll out this project and make it possible. There will be an extra £1 million in the budget for the Household Support Fund, um, and as Councillor Goodliffe um, commented, the CYP committee have been taking a lead on um, free school meals, uh, for which there will be an allocation for that as well. But because of the initiatives we've taken in this area, the County Council is now in a stronger position to keep in touch with universal credit claimants in our county, and we want to establish a helpful relationship uh, with them going forward. We've also continued our commitment to combat domestic violence in whatever forms it takes by allocating 1.1 million to implement key actions from our new strategy, um, and the investment plans for this funding were agreed by committee on the 2nd of July. The Domestic Abuse Act of 2021 places a statutory duty on local authorities such as ourselves to provide safe accommodation for victims of domestic abuse. And as part of this duty, a needs assessment has been undertaken and a strategy has been produced and published, approved by our committee. Refu uh, accommodation for um, refugees who are victims of domestic abuse has been recommissioned from April 2022 onwards. We also have plans for commissioning dispersed accommodation for victims of domestic abuse and able to access refugee accommodation. And they'll be going to our committee meeting in March, alongside plans to commission mobile advocacy support for all victims. Specialist IDVA posts are now in place to support young people, those people from Eastern European communities, male victims, and those from BAE communities who are at all risk levels for, of domestic violence. I very much hope that we'll continue this commitment along with the White Ribbon Ambassador Scheme to highlight and to help and support those who are often victims of domestic violence who are already in a very vulnerable situation. 
And so much great work has taken place in creating a Food Poverty Alliance network for our county. We've been working with the Food Poverty Alliance in Cambridge to support residents who, through no fault of their own, are finding it very difficult to budget and to feed themselves and their families. I know that several members in this chamber today often give up their spare time to set up and help at food banks. The Just Transformation Fund, which we heard a lot about already today, will over the next five years continue to tackle inequality, improve residents' lives and care for the environment. It's because of this fund that we're going to be able to give Think Communities a proposed budget of around one and a half million pounds next year, with around one million of that funded from this fund. On top of that, an extra £350,000 will be applied to top up the Innovate to Cultivate Fund, so there'll be about £1.8 million in total in this budget. This additional investment will be well received by local authority and community groups and partners who will be able to apply for funding to get projects off the ground to increase the reach and impact of local initiatives which fulfil the needs of local residents. We'll be looking to develop local projects that might support our more vulnerable residents who are living alone or in isolation. They might need an extra bit of help in the home um, or even just for a couple of days when they make the transition from hospital to home, for example. We'll also be looking at setting up a care micro enterprises scheme. This will help adults and older people to have a greater choice and control over how their care needs are met. We can help connect people to each other and provide mutual benefits. A prime example of this are the repair cafes that make use of of people's skills and assist those households in need. The Innovate and Cultivate Fund will help to um, move us forward and also next month we'll be progress progressing our plans for decentralisation by building on the strong foundations we have already with a lot of our partners. That's time, Councillor Sanderson. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor MacDonald. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, as part of uh, the Joint Administration budget proposals, I just want to highlight some of the um, focus of uh, the highways and transport plans for the coming year. First of all, um, as we talked about in the uh, amendment debate, we, our intention is to maintain spending levels on highways maintenance, including proactive treatment and maintenance of roads, bridges and footpaths. We're very conscious on the pothole for funding uh, and we want to maintain the level of funding identified for uh, pothole repairs. Thirdly, uh, a very high profile, and uh, the committee voted uh, unanimously uh, on the Wheatsheaf crossroads um, to source extra funding needed to deliver the traffic signals that all members supported at committee. So the real priorities for highways and transport will be um, adopting latest innovative technology for condition surveys and data collection to anticipate and address highways maintenance issues rather than being reactive. We want to establish an active travel strategy for the county, and this will come back to committee in March for discussion with members. We're working closely on an ongoing basis with the Greater Cambridge Partnership on the review of a road hierarchy in Cambridge City. This is an essential and overdue piece of work. Um, very importantly, at the recent committee, we highlighted that we will review the 20 mile an hour policy and the qualifying criteria which will form uh, uh, and develop through a cross-party member working group. We will also look at HGV management policy, which is a key issue for very many of our villages. We're looking to establish protocols for resident parking schemes in conjunction with GCP and in line with the integrated parking strategy. We want to continue development of work on the Huntingdon and Fenland transport strategies to include support for modal shift, and this will come to committee soon. We're looking to implement a new highways drainage strategy as part of the surface water management plan. I know this has uh, uh, been referenced by many members and it is a priority for the committee. We wish to conduct a, uh, conduct a street lighting review. We will also investigate how we will deal with waste and materials from our maintenance activities so we can recycle and reuse as much as we can. And we work very closely with the Cambridge and Peterborough Combined Authority on transport projects. I'd like to thank very much uh, Councillor Shaler, who stepped in at short notice, uh, to be my vice chair, while Councillor Bird uh, has been on extended leave. Thank you, Chair.
Thank you. We're now going to open up the debate to other members. Um, as a reminder, if you've already spoken on the amendment, you are eligible to speak in the main debate. But if you have already spoken, I'd encourage you not to waste too much time in repeating points already made. I have Councillor Thompson first. Thank you, Chair. Since the Joint Administration took over in May at COSMIC, Community Social Mobility and Inclusion Committee, we have been prioritising our anti-poverty objective. Our very first step has been to tackle food poverty. To do this, we are working with Cambridge Sustainable Food to set up an alliance with the aim to ensuring that a healthy and sustainable diet is available to all, particularly those who are vulnerable. Underpinning the development of the alliance is a belief that a shared vision and working together brings results that can be achieved by acting individually. The Alliance will not seek to replace work that is already going on at local level, but aims to bring groups together to share with and learn from each other. Free school meals at our schools have steadily risen since 2018, but since COVID, the increase has nearly doubled. Children and Young People's Committee have ensured that all children on free school meals across Cambridgeshire will receive £3 per day supermarket vouchers during all school holidays for the next financial year, up to and including February 2023 half term. As Councillor Sanderson stated earlier, the Household Fund is experiencing very high demand with over 9,300 applications processed and 2,800 still awaiting. Officers are dealing with about 350 applications per day with the highest in a single day at 673. We thank all the officers for their hard work to help these households. COSMIC has set up a clear approach and a set of concrete of actions that there is still so much work to be done to address fuel poverty, housing poverty, digital poverty and transport poverty. I am extremely proud of our joint administration commitment to pay for the real living wage for all our employees at the County Council and work towards achieving accreditation. I believe it's time to tackle anti-poverty head on, arm in arm, side by side. We are in this together working for a fairer Cambridgeshire. To finish, I would like to quote Mahatma Gandhi, poverty is the worst form of violence. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Dalton. Thank you, Chair. Just transition. We've heard that phrase several times today. £14 million for transition to delivering a greener, fairer, more caring Cambridgeshire. Not only will this fund help tackle climate change, it will also offer more support for the collaborative work that the county does with our district colleagues and with voluntary organisations. It's good to know that our work through the Care Together initiative will be bolstered by this additional funding. We know that collaborative working of this kind is effective and cost effective. The county's Think Communities team can also benefit from these collaborations. Thank you. Oops. Wrong button. Councillor Coots. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to speak briefly and on a single aspect of the budget. One thing I've discovered already as a councillor, and I'm sure this is true for all members here, is how strongly people feel about traffic issues and particularly in terms of road safety in their communities. Within this, I've found the desire for a 20 mile per hour limit in built up areas is growing in strength across the board. However, alongside that, I've also been learning, and again, I'm, I'm sure this will be true for all your colleague, my colleagues here, how difficult it can seem to be to get things done. Everything seems to take so long to be so complicated, to be surrounded by such strange rules, and to be frustrated by shortage of funds. That's why I'm so pleased that this proposed budget has made an allocation to set up a new 20 mile an hour fund and develop the associated processes to go with it. 
the thought that local communities will have a specific route to take forward their requests for 20 mile per hour zones and hopefully see those applications making rapid progress is really exciting. This is only the first step and I know there's a lot of work to be done, but if we can help our communities to achieve the reduction in traffic speeds and improvement in road safety that they want, and to do it without unnecessary delay, that really will be something to be proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shaler. Thank you very much, Chair. Our government didn't fight on the beaches or on the landing grounds. COVID was killing people all over the country and still our PM was shaking hands and parroting Trump. The death and economic destruction must never be forgotten. COVID has caused people to rethink their priorities. It has also taught us to appreciate our local communities, our green spaces, exercise and shopping locally. Active travel brings strong bodies, strong minds, and strong communities. The GCP, the county, and the combined authority have all asked, and the same answer keeps coming back. People want more, safer, active transport routes. On highways, we will bring active transport into all aspects of transport policies and projects. Leisure travel is important. Sightseeing, sports, fitness, touring, hacking, and healthy family fun. Children who grow up active remain active. I have been on horse tracks in other parts of the world. Why not here? We are repairing our existing rights of way network and enhancing it, building a more joined up network. Active tourism, why not? Leisure travel also encourages First play, then commute. Children need safe, non-polluted routes to walk to school. And where that is not possible, the county spends £19 million a year transporting children to school, especially from more isolated, transport-poor regions. It seems obvious that tackling rural transport po poverty could also help with our transport to school budget. Active tra travel also expands the reach of public transport and we need secure cycle parking facilities all over the county. We are leading on the City Changer Cargo Bike Project along with our European and CAM Cycle collaborators. Funding from the Department of Transport has allowed us to purchase 30 electric, electric assist cargo bikes and these will be promoted to businesses and families. This is about building for the future. We know what short-termism does. The mounting human and physical costs of the short-sighted policy to cut prevention and early help for children in the county once again teaches us a stitch in time. On highways, we are looking to early detection at performance indicators and actual performance of our often very large contractors? Could breaking up contracts into smaller parts allow us to support local providers and thus help build wealth in our local communities? We keep coming back to health, sustainability and community. We benefit from our enhanced relationship and coordination with the combined authority. A hearty thank you to our mayor, Nick Johnson, we are also more actively engaged with the GCP, though currently I am, I feel they are failing to understand the local voices on Mill Road. Members know the importance of local voices. Change is coming from the Chisholm Trail to Starship Robots. We work for the whole county, no matter where you come from or who you vote for. And the best thing is, we have only just begun. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Maria King. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> One of the most striking things I learned on becoming a councillor is our responsibility as corporate parents. Um, 
we across Cambridgeshire we just have we have just under 600 children in our care um, and I think we all know and appreciate uh, how much these children and young people need our, our support and um, and how much they deserve it just to give one example um, a child in care is 10 times more likely to be expelled from school than a child living in their own home with their own parents. Um, we, I think we also all know as parents, grandparents, uh, aunts and uncles, probably from our own uh, experiences, how scary and difficult it is to uh, move from childhood into adulthood to, uh, to learn to live independently and to make decisions and uh, I think we also can have some examples how uh, some, some of these decisions might not be the right ones. Um, for children in care, this is exacerbated by often lacking support, uh, emotional and financial, from their families, from, from their nearest and dearest. So, um, as Councillor Goodliffe pointed out, we, um, we have over half of young people uh, who have that opportunity, staying with their parents as they move into adulthood, and children in care do not have that option. So it falls to all of us as corporate parents to support them. And that's why we are introducing a uh, 100% refund on the council tax for young people leaving care up to the age of 21. And further, we will be supporting our care leavers up to age of 25 through a specially created fund. I'm so, so proud to bring this to, into our budget and to support our young people, to support their transition into adulthood and to, to allow them to fully contribute their talents and their time to our society. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Joshua Schumann. Thank you, Chair. Um, may I start by thanking the chairs of the committees for their reports. Um, I know they dedicate an awful lot of hours and hard work to the council in everything they do, so I sincerely thank them for their reports to council today. Um, and also thank them that they are deciding to continue a lot of the good work they inherited from the previous administration. Um, the excellent work which we've heard about today, which uh, will, I'm sure, benefit many residents of Cambridgeshire in future. We didn't hear a lot of justification, sadly, about the need for the increase in taxation, not the transparency that we hope to provide our residents. But that's not surprising, because actually what we've heard today is that money will be put in our bank account for a rainy day. I'm proud to be part of an authority of East Cam's <coughs> District Council, who, although its council tax element is dwarfed by the counties, realises and recognises that not increasing council tax and freezing it for an eighth year not only leaves money in the pockets of, its resident, of our residents, but also recognises the important message that not increasing council tax sends to those who are doing everything they can to stay afloat. We have heard comments today about flooding, both in its literal terms and figuratively, in the financial storm that we face. I do not deny that the financial storm is one which this authority will be challenged by, but that storm is looming on the doorsteps of all of our residents. In the biblical story of the floods, Noah was given the hope, uh, hope by an olive branch that was brought to him. But we've heard comments today from the council's leader that rather than offering an olive branch, instead we chuck water in the face of our residents and justify it by saying, don't worry, it's just a little bit more. Thank you. Councillor Bulat. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I'd like to speak today as a local member, but also as a taxpayer and a resident of this county, and I'd like to speak for this joint administration budget. Like so many people in this county, especially young people, but not only young people, I'm paying between a third and over half of my monthly income on rent alone, depending on how much I earn in my temporary contract and not very secure jobs. And for those interested, actually saving 5% on council tax won't really get, get me anywhere near the property ladder, especially in a very unequal city like Cambridge. So of course, council tax is a big part of that income for many people, and any increases in tax and prices are felt 
for people like me and many people I speak to on a daily basis, especially now when everything else increases in price. But I would like to say that as many residents, I also do not want to see services cut more and more every single year. And it's not all about highways as well. Of course, highways are important. And let me give you an example of highways in my area. After um, last year, after May, we had a lot of dangerous footpaths resurfaced in Abbey that have been reported for years and years in my area by previous councillors. And one resident told me, well, I cannot believe, Alex, this is actually happening now. You know, what has changed? So I will let that question because we have mixed experiences on, <laughs> on that issue. And like many residents, I would actually want to say in this debate that yes, I am happy to pay that extra one pound a week in my council tax bill because I do recognize that there are people who are in much more difficult situations than me. And I don't need some members in the opposition to lecture about you know, what labor values to stand for, because I know what my labor values are, which is actually being there for those in need, while those of us who can actually contribute more are happy to do so, and this opinion is shared by many people in my area. I do welcome the Household Support Fund in particular, free school meals, and all the anti-poverty initiatives of this joint administration, because those are the things that actually I can see they make a real difference in my division in Abbey, which is one of the most deprived areas in the county. I can see how actually investing in those communities who need it the most and who have often been left behind, like the one million towards Cambridgeshire children needing additional support can actually prevent issues in the long term, which will ultimately have higher economic and social costs reduced in the long term. No one pretends this is a perfect situation today because the reality is that no plan can actually be good enough for our residents while we continue to have conservative central government systematically underfunding our county, which was actually recognized when the council tax was raised 5% a couple of years ago uh, by someone who argues against it today. National insurance payments up, food prices up, energy bills hugely up, rent up, benefits that actually don't reflect the actual cost of inflation, I will go way beyond my five minutes if I list all the ways in which the cost of living is rising for our communities. So I'll end on this. I would end with this question, Chair. I would like to ask, what would people choose if they had to choose between those options? So let's say some hypothetical option here. Having a 2% council tax increase with cuts in services, maybe like in 2016, perhaps a 3.59 council tax increase with cuts in services like we had in 2020, maybe a 4.99, let's call it 5% council tax increase, um, like we remember not very long ago, I'm young enough to remember that happening in our county, or actually having the same increase, recognizing the challenging situation, but actually delivering a budget that is more sustainable long-term, that doesn't cut services for the first time in many years, and actually prioritizes our children and the environment. I personally know what I would choose myself, and I know what my residents in Abbey would choose. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Van der Ven. Thank you, Chair. We've all seen the shocking data on disparities in healthy life expectancies across Cambridgeshire. And as councillors, we know firsthand that these play out in every community. A head teacher in my relatively affluent district remarked that she knows exactly which children will wake up tomorrow in homes with empty kitchen cupboards. Every child on free school meals represents a family in which healthy life outcomes stand to be adversely affected. The number of supplementary holiday boxes for families with children on free school meals prepared by my village community support group keeps growing. While inequalities have deepened in recent years, the financial position of this council has worsened through poor stewardship, making it harder to support those in need. Government funding has been unpredictable and short term, making it hard to plan ahead. In this budget, we consider it our duty to plan ahead for those in greatest need, not just for next year, but for the years that follow. Westminster ministries needed to support these efforts have been undergoing costly distraction rebrandings, a sign perhaps that things are in disarray. The words local government have been ominously scratched out and replaced with leveling up. The King's Fund observes that leveling up funds are not distributed on the basis of measures of deprivation, but on need for transport connectivity and need for growth. 
This approach to leveling up will not on its own address disparities in health and life expectancy. So what can we do as a council? With phenomenal support and hard work by our officers, we have found necessary savings and recast the way we deliver public health and social care in ways that are local and community focused and based on the premise that more years lived in good health can only be achieved through improving the wider determinants of health. We are promoting a health and all policies approach to confront some of the biggest root causes of health inequalities. This includes training for staff to understand the health impacts of services and the capacity to undertake health impact assessments to support the council to understand the impact of major policy decisions in terms of health outcomes. What does health and all policies look like in practice? A favorite of mine and one that has come strongly through the pandemic is the Junior Travel Ambassador Scheme in which primary school pupils lead the way on healthy walking and cycling rather than driving to school. These children are even arguing the case, case against nuisance parking by grown-ups on double yellow lines in front of school gates. 26 primary schools are currently involved and applications for September will be going out shortly. It is hoped that five secondary schools will join the scheme next year, widening the experience and influence in the community and helping to persuade more people to get around in new ways and developing better physical and mental health in so doing. Please contact Marie Richards and Lynn Hess if you'd like to learn more. It will be important to complement the work of our district partners in their local plan making, which holds huge potential to influence the wider determinants of health in terms of housing, proximity to jobs, and green spaces. And we are seeing promising signs in the emerging Greater Cambridge local plan. And we have strenuously argued the case for partnership and tackling the wider determinants of health with our NHS colleagues in the newly forming integrated care system in which work on integrated neighborhoods will be strengthened by our new Care Together and Independent Living programs. I'm proud to support this year's budget proposals, which provide a responsible and ambitious steer in the most challenging of times, thanks to all who've helped develop this important work. Councillor Cox Condren. Thank you, thank you, Chair. And thank you too to COSMIC, my Labour colleagues and our joint administration, as we all stand and strive in solidarity for the residents that we represent and for future generations at such a critical time in human history. The economist John Maynard Keynes, son of Florence Ada Keynes, a social reformer and Cambridge's first female town councillor, said the difficulty lies not in the new ideas but in escaping the old ones, which ramify for those of us brought up, as most of us have been, into every corner of our minds. We are all lurching from crisis to crisis, led by a government that we cannot trust as it puts forward divisive and devastating policies against human rights, putting profit for the wealthy over our well-being. We are dead cats and are breaking whilst this government continues to systematically dismantle our NHS and puts energy companies' profits over our lives, whilst we are living with food and, fuel, food and fuel shortages, escalating costs of living, and the fear and consequences of environmental breakdown. And of course that is relevant, because these sharp inequalities of power and wealth mean that our most disadvantaged residents are disproportionately hit. Ordinary working class people, people living with disabilities, people from black and minority ethnic groups, our same residents who have been worse affected by the totally inadequate public transport structure and unaffordable homes in Cambridge and who will be most affected by climate change. As we hopefully recover from COVID-19, we have an opportunity to build a fairer society, shaped by grassroots frontline work that we've seen over the last two years, and we are seizing it. As we develop systems that move beyond emergency planning to create permanent resilience, a power of equality across all social groups. We need, in the words of economist Kate Raworth, founder of Donut Economics, a new vision of human prosperity and progress that is fit for the 21st century as we guide a just transition for our county. 
a just transition where all residents can be represented in decision-making processes through decentralisation, citizen engagement and deliberative democracy, developing networks, human connections and holistic needs-driven approaches such as the Food Poverty Alliance, a just transition building resilience through skill building, mental health hubs, refugee resettlement, support and, sh and shelter for people living with domestic abuse and the libraries of sanctuary model, creating safe, civic spaces, sharing information, resources, creativity, culture and community building um, initiatives. A just transition where funding is awarded equitably across all of our communities and not on a first come first served basis where the procurement system is not weighted in favour of the businesses who can afford weeks of staff time to write bids, but that recognises social value, where the community wealth building model creates connected, vibrant communities and a local economy that benefits and empowers all of our residents, and where nurturing the arts to share our stories, heritage and cultures give gives voice to all communities as we shape the places that we live in, developing greater democracy and sparking the imagination that we vitally need to envisage and create a better future. A better future guided by the principles of donor economics, meeting the needs of all people whilst also meeting the needs of our living planet, recognising that economies, societies and the rest of the living world are complex interdependent systems, but seeing the bigger picture. Octavia Hill, Wisbeach-born social reformer, pioneer, artist, activist, and founder of the National Trust, wrote, when I am gone, I hope my friends will not try to carry out any special system or follow blindly the track that I have trodden. New circumstances require various efforts, and it is the spirit, not the dead form, that should be perpetuated. More important is the quick eye to see, the true soul to measure, the large hope to grasp the mighty issues of better days to come. I think they actually perhaps want to send a letter of thank you to Rishi Sunak for the £150 off council tax, because... I think this year it will allow people not to see a large tax rise. So there's one thing that you can say the Conservative government has done for you, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, we keep hearing this Band C figure bandied about. Um, now, I mentioned this at SNR and I'll mention it again today. I've never in 10 years of being on the council ever heard any council talk about a Band C figure. They always talk about Band D to enable people to understand it in the context of other councils and uh, nationally and the only reason I can see that the administration have done this is because it hides the actual true amount and the true figure and makes it seem like it's less. Now, I get, I get what, where you're coming from. What you're effectively saying is we want to put the tax up to spend on our projects. And I understand the logic of it. While I don't necessarily agree with you with, with it as, as a strategy, I do understand the logic of it. So I guess just be honest about that and own, and own what you're saying. I'm surprised about council tax for care leavers, um, mostly because in a lot of uh, Lib Dem and independent members four years ago um, when we were in charge agreed that it was unnecessary. And now those same members are supporting it. I can only speculate it's just to sort of keep Labour members happy and keep the joint administration propped up. Now I understand why officers are retiring en masse. If they're going to just give advice, it's going to be consistently ignored. Now, I get everything I'm saying is just going to be ignored, and I understand that, and I understand there's a difference of opinion about how you help, um, you know, how you help people. I don't think anyone comes here to not help people, actually, who want to help people. I just think we disagree as to the solutions. Um, but I think virtue signaling really actually often harms people. And energy bills, no one's talking about the massive green levy there is on people's energy bills. And, of course, how can that not harm people if they're paying more? Uh, Councillor Dupre earlier um, took us on a journey of a Fenland resident, but as usual, we are regaled with an understanding of a life that often none of us have lived. It's all well and good talking about people that we help, but let's talk about the normal taxpayer. A factory worker working full-time in Wisbeach will earn £10 an hour. And that works out as a take-home pay after tax of £1,400 a month. Your rent's going to be at least... Top of the 1%, 6.85 million pounds, you're now increasing it by. And that is the truth of your council tax increase. You're not delivering more services, or, or the services you are delivering more are not through the council tax increase that is being washed into reserves. And when we get told about reserves, you can only spend reserves once and therefore be fearful of not having enough general reserves. Your budget has burnt through £27 million of COVID grant in your first attempt, the entire £27 million. £23 million of transformation 
fund gone, redeployed, spent within one year. And that £23 million is to be paid for, that short-term gain will be paid for by your grandchildren in the future, because that's where the money comes from. But you don't care. You don't care. Over and above that money, £10.2 million over and above what you just thought you was coming in came in for next year's budget. When you said you've got to raise council tax by 4.99%, you have £4.2 million left over. But when we asked that figure, which was accurate to be included in the papers, you denied it. In fact, there was another £24 million coming in over the four, further four years, over £100 million more than you have been talking about. And you talk about an £80 million budget deficit. You don't mention the £100 million you've burnt through, squandered, redeployed. Our legacy was also an efficient, well-run council. And I'd just like to say thank you to the, all the officers that have helped us keep it that way, or helped you keep it that way. The officers that are left, of course, I mean, because you have hemorrhaged staff, particularly at the higher level. Your lack of leadership and your inability to understand the necessities of what is going on and some of the virtue signaling that you've chosen instead has led to staff leaving en masse. Not just at the highest levels, but your lack of delivery of services of some £16 million this year is also because your lack of staff throughout the organisation. Much of them put off by working with you and your actually policy interventions, such as your failed attempt to div divorce Peterborough overnight from the shared working partnerships, and now you are left floundering without a plan, having had the peer review and done nothing with it. Thank you, Councillor. I'm, I'm not on five minutes. I'm disappointed particularly when we hear about the services that you, that you talk about delivering more as if there's no service cuts. We already have in the budget the service cut to the inspection of the street lights. In winter, you are cutting the inspections by 50% when our residents need our street lights to work the best. You're also planning and going through a street lighting pro uh, uh, program at the moment where you have plans to cut lights in residential areas, which is all encompassed in the document. But probably the worst one of all is the claim that £1 million will be given to the out-of-hours school clubs so that the most needy, out of uh, those on uh, free school meals, can access out schools clubs. And yet, you have plans to cut £1 million from after-school clubs' free transports to the six special schools that is in your document. And that also is £1 million. Shame on you. And I apologise for interrupting you. Councillor Sharp. Thank you, Chair. I'll be very brief. Um, we've heard some noble things from members opposite about plans for the future, and I'm sure I certainly, and I'm sure a number of members on this side would agree with a lot of those. But what it doesn't do is justify that, that those extra, that those um, things that have been spoken about are not dependent on a council tax increase. Independent members said at the election that they wouldn't side with one colour or another, but listen to the debate. It just appears to me that they've just gone along with the Liberal Democrats and Labour group. And finally, I couldn't allow, I cannot allow Councillor Dupre to get away with, well, she, she almost admitted, I, I use her words, you don't need a coalition to have chaos. Because I know this is a county council meeting, but she referred to East Cambridgeshire. There was a paper that went to finance and assets, I don't sit on that committee, for a five pound increase and the leader, yes, did re remove it by way of an amendment. But we were honest with our residents last February when we put forward our 0% increase for the eighth year running that we may need to increase council tax by five pounds for a, for a band D and taking Councillor Hoy's point, that's what you normally use as a, a metric. Um, and we are still looking to see whether we can actually um, have another 0% increase this year if we can balance the books. So, which we, we, we can do, but, um, you know, I, I'm sorry, I cannot allow Councillor Dupre to get away with that, but thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Goldsack. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I may bring a, 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 an unexpected tone to my uh, comments here, if I can. And that is, we know the way that this debate's going to go. We know the way the vote's going to go. So I'm going to wish you every success in delivering everything that you've promised. I'm a resident of Cambridgeshire. I represent, represent, I represent residents of Cambridgeshire. I would ask a few things of you, please, in addition to that written down that you are almost certainly going to win the vote in today. One is, in the last administration, the Commercial Investment Group, of which no longer exists, brought in over £40 million worth of commercial revenues that were deployed to the front line, which helped save tax revenues. Maybe at a future meeting or maybe somewhere, rather than digging and delving and trying to find it, you could let us know what your commercial investment plans are, because we can't see them in the budget. And secondly, far more simplistic, if I can, the words that are in print are very difficult to change. The words that are spoken don't always match that was in print. Let me just give you three very quick examples. One, in the debate earlier on the initial amendment, the deputy leader said that you would meet net zero by 2030. That's not what your words say, but that's what your deputy leader said. You can't do that by 2030, and we largely, as you know, in green, green investment and uh, environment meeting, we know that we largely back everything so far. But your retrofit schools programme is going to take you to at least 2045 at your current run rate. So just be honest with the people of what you're going to do. The second point on honesty, right? Whatever we think of the levelling up paper, to see a press release issued before the, reveling, before the said paper was published, a little bit disingenuous, I think. And I think it's a little bit unfair on the people of Cambridgeshire. So just be honest. Either wait or tell them your interpretations you're expecting, but not your actuals when it hadn't even been published by the central government mentioned so many times today. And thirdly, and, and in no particular order, um, if there's a commitment to pay the living wage, the real living wage, uh, to care workers, commend you for it. Well done. Why are they waiting until 2027 when you've got all this money in reserves? Why couldn't you make it one of your priorities? I don't, I, 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 the, these are the things that, you know, the spoken word versus the written word. So I do wish you well on behalf of my residents, on behalf of my own family, all of which live in Cambridgeshire. So good luck and be honest with people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Bowden. Thank you very much, Chair. I'd just like to speak on one very small part of the, uh, of the paper that we have in front of us. And uh, that is to do with, and it's quite well hidden, it's, it's to do with the public health reserve. Now, I was on the old health committee for three years in the last administration, and I've been uh, placed on the new adults and health committee under the new administration. And those who were on the health committee under the last administration will know that we had a very collaborative approach as far as public health was concerned. And they will also know that I particularly highlighted the need to keep the public health reserve to an appropriate level and to make sure that to the extent that it crept up that we utilized it for the benefit of the residents of Cambridgeshire. But we always needed to keep the public health reserve at a given level because we needed to save for a rainy day. My goodness, was COVID a rainy day? And uh, the pressures that have been placed on our public health staff and so many other cannot be overstated, and Councillor Howard actually mentioned, mentioned those pressures. And one of the effects of those pressures has actually been to make it difficult to spend the whole of our public health money that we have allocated to us. I fully accept it's difficult, but it's not impossible, especially when you make those payments through third parties. And it really saddens me that no significant attempt has been made to deal with the rising public health reserve, that we're actually at a time of crisis increasing our public health reserve rather than utilising it effectively during our time of crisis. Now, we did receive, finally, belatedly, after the best part of seven months, a paper at Adults and Health showing proposals to spend some of the public health reserve. But those proposals didn't go far enough in terms of the amount they were spending and were also spread out over three years. So what we're going to see happening, or what I predicted at the time we were going to see happening, and I still stick to that prediction now, is that by the end of next year, we will have an even greater public health reserve than we had 
uh, two months ago when these proposals were first brought forward uh, to the Adults and Health Committee. And that is shocking. What I would ask, Chair, is that careful consideration be given by those who now control the Adults and Health Committee, and it has to be said health is no longer a collaborative function. Uh, health uh, has, been made, has been party politicized, and now it is, it is far less effective than it otherwise could have been and used to be. But I ask those who actually control the health side of the Adults and Health Committee to give consideration to seriously looking at how, over the course of the next few months, more of that public health reserve can be utilised than is currently being proposed. Because there are so many desperate needs across the whole of Cambridgeshire. The most obvious one, which I'd, I'd, I'd highlight, is, is children's mental health. But there are a whole host of other needs as well, which have been generated and which have been made much worse as a result of the COVID crisis. Please ask the administration, look at using more of that health reserve and using it urgently to meet the needs that we've got in the county. Thank you, Chair. Chair, point of personal explanation. Uh, that point was made also in brief by the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, it's been said at both the Strategy and Resources Committee and in the Adults and Health Committee, so let's just put on the record uh, that the underspend that existed was because our staff were dealing with the COVID pandemic. And it's not about just getting rid of the money, it's about it being effective in meeting health needs. I will welcome if there is further underspend because then we will utilise the money but the whole council should be assured that the proposals that we brought forward on the recommendation of the Director of Public Health was left the minimum reserve that she thought was necessary Chair. pending. Chair. May I finish? Chair. Pending. Council Count, yes. Chair, point, point, point of order Can I actually here? finish what, what my own of, point? What, what rule are you suggesting has been broken, Councillor Count? It's Council a point account. of personal exactly explanation. Councillor Count has a floor. It is the point of personal explanation, as you said, as Councillor Kindersley said at the start of this meeting, it is to give clarity to a point that was raised. The very first part of Council Howitz did gave clarity to that, which was the point that he spoke to earlier. Now we have just gone into speech making. There I agree no with you, Councillor Howitz. Councillor Howitz, thank you for your point. Um, we're going to move on to Councillor Simon King now. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I think that uh, Councillor Hoy made some really ver very valid points about the plight of many people throughout the county, but also particularly in Fenland, which is uh, a very deprived area, as we all know, or parts of it are very deprived. I think that we must never underestimate the importance of good transport links in all of this. And, I, I, and while I welcome a lot of what uh, Councillor Cox Condron said, I think that to downplay the value of transport investment is a serious mistake. There's, there's a simple reason why Cambridge is such a buoyant and uh, affluent economy. And it's got a motorway, it's got an airport close by, and it's got very good rail links. Um, these things inevitably lead to prosperity. Um, and, and I think it's really important that we don't lose sight as a county of improving the transport links to the north of the county. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no other speakers on this debate, we're going to give Councillor Machini the opportunity to exercise a right to speak as Councillor Bywater at the last moment. Yeah, thank you, Chair, um, and, and congratulations on your appointment. I wasn't going to speak, but I just feel the need to... Um, obviously, the council tax increase is not sitting happily with my residents. I've spoken to many before this meeting today, or myself, and the current leader of this council, uh, as in my nine years that I've been present here, has always had the fixed mindset of increasing council tax to the max, despite the landscape of the particular time. Over the years, uh, we've seen um, pressures on our, on our local services, uh, the utilities are rocketing, uh, food and fuel are astronomical and, you, you know, uh, all, all the pressures that we see are, are hugely high for our residents. And, and it's quite easy to say, oh, 45 pence here or it's only a pound here, but that all depends on what disposable income you've got left at the end of each month. It's nice to see that some proposals going forward are the legacies of the Conservative administration. Mentoring care leavers... Uh, the pilot scheme that we introduced off the back of the very successful Children's Change Programme uh, has also seen our lack numbers reduced from 
800, over 800 to 575 as of last week. This leads me to the council tax for care leavers proposal. It's very admirable. Uh, it's great um, for when you want to fly the political flags. It, it looks good. Uh, but there is a but here. There was a very good reason why we didn't vote for this in the previous administration. Uh, and the cost that's highlighted for about £425,000 that it's going to bring. And I see no evidence of these questions that I'm going to raise. Has the administration really interrogated the evidence that sits behind this? What happens to our out-of-county children? Are we going to create a two-tier system where children in Cambridgeshire get tax relief or uh, they're in a local authority in a placement where they will be taxed? So that may bring legal challenge to this council. It seems to me that this, this is rather ill thought out and rushed. Uh, my experience tells me that many young people uh, benefit from role models, mentoring. You know, they, 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 they benefit from this because they see the positive mindset that this brings, uh, which is why I'm really grateful that we're going to continue this pilot scheme. Finally, I want to just talk about the CYP savings targets. Uh, let, let me remind the chair of the CYP committee and this administration. It will become your responsibility from this moment forward. The last year has been relatively easy, um, and we see it as you've been on probation, but ultimately the decisions and the outcomes will be your responsibility. Going forward, I'm going, like many members, going to be watching this and these saving targets because, as it's been pointed out, the last time I saw people exit in the door as quickly as we've seen some of the officers was on a C-130 Hercules when paratroopers were jumping out the door. Given these concerns and my concerns over the tax increases and the cash, real cash burdens that this is going to have on my residents, uh, I won't be supporting this budget. Thank you, Chair. Another last-minute contribution from Councillor Goodliffe. Just a point of explanation to mention that the care leavers will cover all of our Cambridgeshire care leavers, regardless of where they're located and living. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Goodliffe. So we move to Councillor Machini now. Thank you. Is that all right? Can I go? Yes. Um, a very, very interesting debate. I will pick up just a couple of points that have been made since we started on this item. Um, first of all, very interesting, do not take your clues about conservative policy from their conservative motions. Um, fine, I won't, but uh, can I suggest it's not me you need to worry about confusing. Um, it doesn't matter what happens at Westminster, well I beg to bloody differ. Um, Councillor Hoy, I will never ignore nor forget you, absolutely not. Um, although it is actually a little bit confusing because while you um, refuse to support the national insurance hike, you, don't, you, you do support the, 100, the £150 council tax rebate, which needs to be paid back. Well, which, which is it? And transport in Finland, yes, it's completely absent. Whose fault is it? Um, and Councillor Count um, spent half his speech saying we save too much and the other half saying we spend too much. So once again, which Councillor Tierney, have yes. you got a point of order? Sorry, continue. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, no, that's, that's just a whistle stop tour. Um, I would like to absolutely, in conclusion of this debate, acknowledge just how difficult it is going to be for us as a county to pull through these difficult times. And the hard reality of 4.99% on every household is acknowledged. But we have introduced real and immediate measures to reimburse those hardest hit. And unlike the government, we aren't enforcing a repayment plan. Free school meal vouchers for the whole of the financial year, £20 directly in the pockets of a universal credit or tax credit recipients, the household support fund, council tax rebates for chair leavers, and all of this is key to increasing the spending power of the lowest earners, and this is actually the most important thing you can do to keep the economy going. Raising council tax for those who can afford it is not only enabling us to reimburse those who can't, but it's also allowing us not to make any cuts to frontline services for the first time in nine years. And it's allowing us to plan for the high level of risk we are living under in the following areas. 33 million pounds and counting debt against the Ringfence Schools Grant, which is what we're saving up against. Wildly increasing inflation predictions currently at 7%, which is absolutely insane. And can I just make the point that the actual reserve balance that we brought forward into 2021 was already 4% of budget. 
So although we made it policy, it didn't require any budget movement. So all of the points of order that were raised previously about you put money into reserve is not true. And we have terrifying budget deficits staring at us in the face from year two of the MTFS. And we have chosen to deploy 4.5 million of the government settlements sustainably over the MTFS to mitigate it. It still remains terrifying, and it certainly looked terrifying from the Conservative amendment. Now, I believe there will be, the leader will sum up after my speech, but I do absolutely have to conclude by thanking every colleague that has worked with me over the past six, seven months. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, it's not easy, but it is, it is absolutely rewarding to do the work that we're doing. And, you know, whilst nothing is perfect about anything that we are living in, we're finally, as a county, on a budget trajectory that, while less than ideal, I don't feel mortified to my core about. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Natsinga. Thank you. The Conservatives have tried today to present the new joint administration as unreliable and our budget proposals as unnecessary. However, it has been acknowledged by even the current Conservative Chair of the Local Government Association that to keep providing services at pre-pandemic levels, every council will have to raise council tax by the maximum in the next financial year. And that's a direct quote from the Conservative Chair of the Local Government Association. We do know that many households in Cambridgeshire are facing a really difficult year. The effect of the pandemic has been very unequal. People in Cambridgeshire whose lives have not been affected by illness or disability, whose income is secure, or who have been able to work largely from home have been less affected. But those who were struggling before are facing a more precarious situation now, and sadly, more people have joined them. This group are most affected by increases in energy bills, by increases in national insurance tax, and by the loss of universal credit. They are also the most likely to need social care help. If we take steps now to close the budget gap we have been left with, we can protect those essential services that vulnerable groups need and use most, not only this year, but in the years to come. But while we do this, we plan to offer a direct safety net for the most vulnerable. The Household Support Fund, with a £20 payment now available to all 39,000 Cambridgeshire people on universal credit, as well as additional help if people need it with specific bills or replacement of essential things like cookers, washing machines or fridges. A pledge to continue to fund free school meals of £15 a week for each eligible child throughout the school holidays and an 100% council tax rebate for care leavers until they are 21, alongside a targeted fund to support them if they need it until they are 25. In addition to this support for those needing financial help, we are also proposing £29 million county-wide programme to support older people living in their own communities and homes for longer as part of a proposed investment in a new vision to create a carer and more, fairer and more caring Cambridgeshire. Increased investment in projects which support biodiversity and Cambridgeshire people's access to open spaces. More investment to improve the safety of our roads and the accessibility of our footways and bridle paths. We will continue to roll out the real living wage, not just to our own lowest paid staff, but also working with our contractors and suppliers organisations to make this aspiration a reality as soon as possible. The Conservatives, locally and nationally, seem to want to paint all politicians as unreliable and chaotic. Looking at the leader of the Conservative Party, I can understand why they would want the public to feel that all politicians are unreliable. But that narrative that politicians cannot be trusted is not true, and it does a disservice to their own councillors, many of whom work hard and do their best for their residents, as well as to politicians in other parties. This budget reflects the key priorities of the Joint Administration, and it is our first step in delivering on the promises that we made as a Joint Administration in May. These are difficult times in many ways, and we do not underestimate the challenges ahead as we face rising costs and staff shortages in key sectors of the economy. But this budget does reflect our determination to protect our vulnerable residents and deliver a greener, fairer and more caring Cambridgeshire. And I hope you will support it. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to move to a vote on the motion, which is recommendations as set out in the report at agenda item number eight. 
Uh, can a democratic services manager please conduct a recorded vote? Thank you, Chair. Again, I'll read out your surnames, and if you can indicate how you wish to vote, please. Uh, Ambrose Smith. Against. Atkins. For. Batchelor. For. Beckett. For. Billington. For. Bowden. Against. Bradnam. For. Bulat. For. Bywater. Against. Connor. Against. Corney. Against. Costello. Against. Count. Against. Coots. For. Cox Condren. Dalton. For. Dupre. For. Ferguson. For. French. Against. Fuller. Against. Gardner. Against. Gay. For. Giles. Goldsack. Against. Goodliffe. For. Goff. For. Gowing. Against. Hathorn. For. Hay. Against. Howe. Against. Howitt. For. Hoy. Against. Kindersley. For. Jonas King. Against. Maria King. For. Simon King. Against. MacDonald. For. Maguire. Miskini. For. Mills. For. Murphy. For. Nessinga. For. Prentice. Against. Ray. For. Sanderson. For. Josh Schumann. Against. Shayla. For. Sharp. Against. Slatter. For. Smith. Against. Taylor. Thompson. For. Tierney. Against. Van der Ven. Whelan. For. Wilson. For. Chair, the result of the vote is 33 votes in favour, 23 against and no abstentions. The motion is therefore carried. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the Council's business plan and budget proposals. The next item is number nine, recommendations to full Council from the Strategy and Resources Committee, tre uh, Treasury Manage Re Management Report, quarter two update, 21-22. Can I ask the Chair of the Strategy and Resources Committee, Councillor Nathinga, to move that the recommendations set, set out on pages two and three of this agenda uh, be adopted and ask the Vice Chair, Councillor Machini, to second, please. Happy to... Um, move the recommendation. Would anybody like to speak in debate? Councillor Bowden. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Uh, I absolve Councillor Neth Singler and Councillor Machini for being responsible for writing this report. I'm quite confident that it was written by the Director of Resources and the Chief Finance and I, Chair, is the quarter two update of the Treasury Management Report and the world has moved on since then. Let me just say that this report, which has been so casually proposed by the leader, let's just see some of the things which are contained within it. We've got a comment that financial markets are now pricing in a first increase in bank rate from 0.1% to 0.25% in February 2022. We see the comment there are now also three increases in the bank rate expected over the period to March 2024. My goodness, are those numbers wrong now? What we had was an increase from 0.1% to 0.25% on the 16th of December. Then last month on the 3rd of February, we had an increase from 0.25% to 0.5%. And far from it being likely to, that the base rate being 0.75% uh, by March 24, it's not impossible that the base rate is going to be 0.75% by March 2022, by next month. And we're going to see further increases beyond that. Now, the reason this is of concern to us is that we have a very significant amount of debt. Net, 800 million, give or take 100 million. And a quarter of that was due to mature within 12 months, and most of it would need to be refinanced by one means or, or another. There are some pluses and minuses in that, but mostly that statement is true. And 
all of the figures which are in this report are based on those very out-of-date assumptions about future interest rates, future bank rates, uh, uh, which, which quite clearly now are no longer valid. So my question to the leader is, uh, to what extent were these figures subject to sensitivity analysis and to stress testing so that we can now have some assurance that even though there have been significant changes in the underlying assumptions uh, behind this report, that we can still rely upon the conclusions of the report. Councillor Singer. Uh, I, I'm happy to respond because um, I just want to check whether anyone else wants to speak because normally in debate you hear the speak and, and then the person comes back at the end. I don't have any other hands, so I think it's okay for you to sum up. In which case, I will sum up. Um, I, so I absolutely recognise that the um, figures are out of date because the economic picture is moving very quickly. I think it's something that we are all aware of and we're aware of the risks that that poses to this council. Um, in relation to the precise stress, stress testing that Councillor Bowden um, wanted more information on, um, as he has recognised, the report was not written by me, and I would suggest that a written response to him from um, the Chief Financial Officer and his staff would be a more appropriate way of dealing with that rather than in this meeting. Um, but, but we are certainly extremely aware of the um, impact of changes in the economic situation on the future of this Council, and it's one of the reasons why um, the budget debate has just gone in the way that it has. Thank you. Okay, so we'll now move to the vote. Um, all those in favour of the motion, please raise your hands. Uh, anybody against the motion? Any abstentions? That's carried, thank you. Item number 10 is a recommendation to full council from the Environment and Green Investment Committee, the review for climate change and environment strategy to the council for adoption as corporate policy. Can I ask the chair of the Environment and Green Investment Committee, Councillor Debray, to move that the recommendations set out on pages 21 of the council agenda be adopted and ask the vice chair, Councillor Gay, to second. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to propose this. Do you want me to speak now or after Councillor Gay has confirmed that he's seconding? Speak now, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> On taking office in May 2021, this joint administration committed to put climate change and biodiversity at the heart of this Council's work. The updated strategy referred unanimously to this committee as an ambitious step on that journey. We're starting from a strong place. In May 2019, this council committed to the development of a climate change and environment strategy, and following the repeated urging <coughs> of my colleague, Councillor Susan van der Ven, this was widened to include declaring a climate and environment emergency. The strategy was adopted by this council in May 2020 and was a crucial first step to raise the profile of the biodiversity and climate crises in Cambridgeshire, and it recently achieved second place in an analysis of the strategies adopted by county councils across the UK. <clears throat> the new joint administration set to work early on to build on this work and initiate a review of the strategy with the aim of acting faster to address the emergency and bring forward targets towards 2030 when they were later than that. We committed to complete that review by December 2021 and indeed on the 16th of December the Council's Environment and Green Investment Committee considered the draft strategy. Since that meeting, the strategy has been further revised to include a definition of scope one, two and three emissions early on, to include non-motorised users in the low carbon transport section of the technical report and to strengthen communications opportunities, particularly with reference to the single equality strategy. Since the 2020 strategy, there have been a number of significant developments nationally and internationally. Commitment to reduce UK greenhouse gas emissions by 78% by 2035, based on a 1990 baseline, reflecting the recommendation from the UK's Independent Climate Commission's Six Carbon Budget and supplementing the existing net zero by 2050 target. The publication of a heat and building strategy, net zero strategy, Environment Act 2021, Agriculture Act 2020 and Transport Decarbonisation 2021 by the government and of course COP26 in Glasgow. 
Local authorities across the country are sharing best practice to speed up learning for everyone and turn this into action to reduce carbon emissions. So much learning on climate change has taken place in the last two years and the review of our strategy has provided an opportunity to reflect on that learning and make changes. The sixth IPCC report published in August last year described how critical the next 10 years will be in the race against the biggest impacts of climate change and COP26 showed how financial institutions and large organisations are now getting behind the transition to a low carbon future and we're now seeing the impact this can have. Large companies are really starting to look at supply chain carbon emissions to understand the risks companies are carrying and pushing suppliers to cut emissions. And we're also seeing new financial mechanisms such as green bonds being explored and used more commonly. Locally, the Climate Commission has published its final report and recommendations to guide us to deliver net zero by 2050. The recommendations of this panel highlight the urgency of the action needed and the increased severity of climate impacts if this action is delayed. They also recognise the importance of protecting the most vulnerable in society and delivering a just transition to ensure no one is left behind. Updating our own strategy is an opportunity to reflect these developments and move forward faster and with increased ambition, matching the increased enthusiasm from the public sector businesses and communities. The scale and extent of the climate and environment crises have become more apparent as we've seen severe weather impacts both here and abroad and the devastation resulting from inadequate action. Now is the time to reflect on the learning of the last two years, assess new evidence and agree an updated strategy that can harness the pace and scale of those changes. The revised strategy is the product of ongoing dialogue with councillors, officers, district council partners, the combined authority, communities, businesses and the third sector. The new joint administration has taken a new approach using the strategy to increase the pace and scale of carbon reductions in Cambridgeshire requires organisations, businesses, communities and residents to collaborate and cooperate. Our focus is therefore on being clear with communities and business about what's needed and how we're going to do it, providing reliable and trustworthy information and signposting businesses and communities to good practice, working together to deliver the recommendations of the Independent Commission and achieving change at lower cost for everyone in Cambridgeshire, and ensuring ownership of the challenge is apparent in every part of the Council. We've restructured the proposed strategy to consist of a high-level strategy, a technical report and a dynamic action plan. These will be supplemented by additional documents, the Carbon Footprint Report from January, a Communications and Engagement Plan and a Net Zero and Improving Nature and Resourcing Plan. So we have a new ambition for Cambridgeshire to reach net zero emissions for 2045. Uh, uh, for the Council ourselves, our, net tar our target That's is to reach net afraid, zero by 2030. Time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gay, are you prepared to yes, second I, that motion? I'd like to uh, second that and reserve my right to reply. So I'm going to open up the floor to debate. Councillor Schumann. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you, Chair, very briefly, could I just ask the proposer to, when they sum up, to answer a couple of brief okay. questions? Um, firstly, yeah. the question um, of whether this strategy we underpinned by a clear action plan. Um, which will hopefully identify how uh, funding allocations will be spent rather than the inertia which we've previously seen. And secondly, that this action uh, strategy will mean that Council will adopt a policy position, which means that when it looks to renew energy contracts, etc., that we look for the most green options and adopt the most green options going forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Don't see any other hands. Councillor Count. Yes, thank, thank you, Chair. I welcome the fact that the um, Conservative-led uh, policy strategy document has been updated, and I welcome the fact that it was acknowledged there was that Conservative-approved policy document that won second nationally uh, last week. Um, and we, we shall see next year how this policy document fares, um, because one of the other things we had uh, was, of course, the original policy document had the Friends of the Earth quoting it as essential reading. Now, I'm not quite convinced this one will be as essential reading because I'm going to focus somewhat on the points between the first one and this one. The point in the last document was to lead Cambridgeshire to carbon net zero by 2050. And I admire the fact that you're, you believe that can be done by 2045. Inside that document, there was a strategy about what to do with the County Council's own efforts. And we laid out very clear plans <coughs> for scope one, two, and three. And despite all the rhetoric that we have heard about moving towards 2030 for County Council itself, 
Those targets haven't been changed, nor has the £16 million that we allocated been matched. The lack of aspirations from this council has actually translated into moving from leadership for Cambridgeshire to let's focus on our own and actually disguise the fact that scopes one, two and three are not in the document as being achieved by 2030. Instead, you use blithering words like we will be moving our target towards where none of the scopes have changed. In fact, the document is populated now by sentence after sentence after sentence saying, we will work with somebody else to do this, we will work with somebody else to do that. I think Greta Thunberg would look at those additional sections as a case of blah, blah, blah. In terms of climate change, we heard a lot in the budget today about how we will invest in climate change, how we will invest in flood prevention. £75,000 for flood prevention, whilst welcome and a first step. You will not solve the flooding issues of St Neots, March, Alconbury, St Ives, all of which have been through a report that show exactly what is needed to be done there. It's a much more serious commitment. And in climate change, you've allocated £340,000. Well, when you don't spend the £300,000 you already got this year, not one penny, I don't see that as new investment. So whilst I welcome this, and I'm glad that we're on the same journey, let's talk more effort. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hathorne, please. Of course, the County Council alone cannot get this strategy. And we'd like to applaud the officers who have worked really hard to produce a credible, realistic and ambitious strategy. It moves us closer to net zero. A date of 2045 for the county may sound a long way off, but we know how tough it is going to be to reach net zero, and we need to grab any opportunity available to bring that date forward. The costs of meeting net zero have already been raised in this debate, and it is true that they are very high. But the thing they are dwarfed by is the costs of not reaching net zero, and the very real human impact not reaching net zero will have on the residents of Cambridgeshire. So getting to net zero is not going to be easy. It's going to require tenacity, ambition, cross-party working, creativity and much more, all of which are in this strategy, which I strongly support. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I want to start by saying that uh, my remarks do not reflect the opinions of any of my colleagues, most of whom, all of them probably, completely disagree with me. So I'm just speaking for myself. I don't support this. I won't be voting for this. I believe that the costs of the net zero plans you have and you and others have in place will be catastrophic for the people of Cambridgeshire. And I do not believe that the costs of not pursuing them will be catastrophic. Now, I know others do not share my view on that. That's fine. A lot of people do, though. And I tell you what, and I believe this absolutely, as the costs become clearer, the public mood will change. And the reason it will change is because it's very easy to talk about ideas in the sky and making the world cleaner. And of course, we all want that, and I do too. But when the costs start to show, people's mood is going to change. I won't be voting for this. Thank you. Thank you. And would anybody else like to speak before I move to Councillor Gay? In which counts? Councillor Gay, please. I don't think I need to uh, reiterate the excellent sum summary of the climate change strategy which is being presented to Council today that was put forward by uh, Councillor Dupre. Um, so I just thought I'd highlight uh, one particular initiative which has been very successful, and that is the Cambridge University Science and Policy uh, Exchange. This is a group of PhD students who, in addition to their doctoral research, um, have spent a huge amount of time and energy putting together a detailed framework for achieving zero carbon in Cambridgeshire uh, in the ambitious time frame um, that we have set out in the Environment and Green Investment Committee. Uh, they've come up with some very innovative ideas about how this can be achieved from a financial point of view, including things like green bonds uh, and carbon pricing. <coughs> However, I think, as has been said by uh, some of the contributors, this question of funding is the absolutely uh, critical one. And we need to take advantage of all the opportunities there are to secure funding to, uh, to um, complete our projects. And some of that funding will come from 
specific grants from central government which have been uh, set out recently, although those central government grants are clearly inadequate and a big upscaling of the programme is actually needed. But absolutely critical for our green uh, programme uh, are loans from the Public Works Loan Board. PWLB provides low-cost, long-term, fixed-interest loans for, for, for critical infrastructure project to projects to uh, local authorities. Um, and, of course, it was this partially uh, to um, set up the pioneering Swatham Prior community heat project, uh, which is seen as an exemplar for uh, decarbonising uh, uh, heating um, across Cambridgeshire and, indeed, the whole na nation. So the Joint uh, Administration uh, is prepared to use any f source of funding that uh, it can find in order to... Uh, to um, fund our decarbonisation plans, uh, including uh, funding from the Public Works Loan Board. And I have to say, this is in stark contrast to the use of PWLB funds by the previous Conservative uh, administration. This money uh, is there for critical infrastructure projects, flood protection, renewable energy, um, building new schools, and yet the last Conservative administration spent £113 million setting up a property speculation company, This Land, in 2016, and then had it run by their cronies. This appalling misuse of public money has led, after six years, to the county having a staggering £53 million of unsecured liability, according to the latest audited accounts. By contrast, there has been absolutely nothing delivered for the people of Cambridgeshire from this scheme, except for a few high-end houses that 95% uh, cannot afford. So we won't take any lessons from the Conservative group about how, uh, how to de deliver the green future. Just to conclude, I'd like to pay tribute to the excellent staff uh, who are driving forward these climate change, uh, cl climate change uh, issues, and particularly... Uh, the uh, lead officers uh, like um, Cheryl French. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dupre. Would you like to sum up? Thank you very much. Um, well, that was a short but interesting debate. In response to Councillor Schumann, yes, there absolutely is an action plan. It's already there. And yes, we will be uh, focusing relentlessly on that to make sure it's implemented. Yes, of course, we'll be going for the greenest options for our procurements, but we will examine them very carefully and not be lured down primrose paths simply because they've got the word green in front of them. I was very disappointed by Councillor Count's reference to blah, blah, blah uh, in terms of, of the, the sections about working with other people. 96% of our emissions are in our own supply chains. So partnership is essential. How are we going to achieve reduction of our scope three emissions if they are so dependent on the activities of other people in our communities. Of course, it's all about partnership. Thank you very much indeed to councillors Hathorne and, and Gay for your contributions to the debate and that, that uh, support is appreciated and I particularly thank Cuspy for its work. It's done some really good work on this. And, and uh, councillor Tierney, of course, was speaking on his own behalf, not on the behalf of his conservative colleagues, but they are quite happy to keep him in post as their representative on the Environment and Green Investment Committee, and that speaks volumes. The, in conclusion, this, this strategy now has a new ambition for Cambridgeshire as a county to reach net zero emissions by 2045 through mobilising action to attract investment and increase the pace and scale of delivery. For the council itself, our target is to reach net zero by 2030. This is now a whole council endeavour. All, all services will need to build knowledge and skills to deliver carbon emissions reductions. Over half of the carbon reductions we need to achieve depend on the choices communities and businesses make in their everyday lives. Heating buildings, travelling to work or leisure, buying food and clothing. The strategy therefore focuses heavily on the need for the council and others to engage, support and collaborate widely, inspiring ourselves and others to make positive change. There's much to do and a need to do it urgently. It'll cost less if we take action early and more if we delay. And I encourage all members, even Councillor Tierney, to support this revised strategy. Thank you. Thank you. I can see a hand from Councillor Bradham. Debate's now over, Councillor Bradham. Correct. I just wanted to ask for a recorded vote when we come to it.
Thank you. How many, how many hands do we need for a recorded vote? So do you have 14 people to support you? Who's in favour of a recorded vote, please? I think that's carried. So I'll hand it over to the monitoring officer to... Uh, Democratic Service Officer, sorry, to, um, to record the vote. Um, as usual, I'll read your name up. Please indicate how you wish to vote. Uh, Ambrose Smith. Four. Atkins. Four. Batchelor. Four. Beckett. Four. Billington. Billington. Okay. No longer here. He's left. Uh, Bird. Oh, sorry. Uh, Bowden. Against. Uh, Bradnam. Four. Bulat. Four. Bywater. Four. Connor. Four. Corney. Four. Costello. Four. Count. Four. Coots. Four. Cox Condren. Four. Daughton. Four. Uh, Dupre. Four. Ferguson. Four. French. Four. Fuller. Four. Gardner. Four. Gay. Four. Giles. Four. Goldsack. Four. Goodliffe. Four. Goff. Four. Gowing. Four. Hathorn. Four. Hay. Howe. Four. Howitt. Four. Hoy. Against. Kindersley. Four. Jonas King. Four. Maria King. Four. Simon King. Four. MacDonald. Four. Maguire. Four. Miskini. Mills. Four. Murphy. Four. Nessinga. Four. Prentice. Four. Ray. Four. Sanderson. Four. Josh Schumann. Four. Shaler. Four. Sharp. Four. Slatter. Four. Smith. Four. Taylor. Thompson. Four. Tierney. Against. Van der Ven. Four. Whelan. Wilson. Four. Chair, the result of the votes is 51 votes in favour, three against and no abstentions. The motion is therefore carried. Thank you. Next is agenda item number 11, recommendations to full council from the Audit and Accounts Committee, arrangements for the appointment of external auditors from 23-24 to 27-28. Can I ask the Chair of the Audit and Accounts Committee, Councillor Wilson, to move the recommendation as set out on page three uh, and ask Vice Chair Councillor Gay to second. Thank you, Chair. The Council's external auditors are currently appointed by the Public Sector Audit Appointments Limited under national procurement arrangements for local authorities. PSAA is a subsidiary of the Local Government Association. The Council agreed to enter into those agreements for five years starting in 2018-19 rather than procuring our external auditor locally. We've now received a letter from PSAA inviting us to enter into the next five-year external audit appointment process commencing in 2023-24. This is a decision for full council, but at its meeting in, on, in November, the Audits and Accounts Committee considered the options for appointing our external auditor, and we agreed that continuing to opt in to the national arrangements would be most likely to deliver value for money and ensure that we continue to have the services of a qualified registered audit firm. So therefore, Chair, Council is asked to confirm the arrangement 
for opting into the national arrangements for five years from 2023-24. Thank you. And uh, I second that. This is a fairly straightforward administrative matter, although I would observe that there have been considerable problems in audit over the last two years because of delays uh, and um, uh, overwork of the um, um, companies, uh, which hopefully can be overcome because it has been causing quite significant difficulties. Thank you. I'm going to open the floor to debate if there is any. If not, then I think we can take it that uh, we uh, that that is. We will take those recommendations as carried. If there's no objections, thank you. Agenda item number twelve uh, is the audit and accounts committee annual report, including your council agenda on pages twenty three to twenty nine. Can I ask Councillor Graham Wilson, chair of the audit and accounts committee, to move receipt of the report? Th thank you, chair. If I can just take members through a few highlights of the report. Uh, which is the report of the Audit and Accounts Committee covering the financial year 2020 to 2021. And firstly, can I apologise for an error in paragraph 3.2.2 of the report. It was the draft statement of accounts for 2019-20, not 2020-21, which was first presented to committee on the 30th of July 2020. If anybody noticed that, you get a special gold star. Following the local elections in May 2021, a new committee was formed with me as the new chair, and therefore it should be noted that the large part of the report covers the work of the previous committee. I would like to thank officers and members of that committee for all their work during the year. Neil Hunter, the new head of external inter sorry, the new head of internal audit started in post on the 1st of January 2021, and Tom Kelly at the front was appointed Chief Financial Officer from the start of May 2021. The report sets out the work of the committee across the previous financial year, with updates where relevant on the current position. The Chief Internal Auditor in his annual report in July 2021 gave a strong satisfactory assurance on the council's control environment, highlighting the strength of the organization's business continuity and risk management processes in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, during the year, the internal audit team considered 23 matters treated as whistleblowing referrals across a wide range of issues from governance fraud and theft, safeguarding and overpavements. The committee has maintained oversight of the delivery of the Council's statement of accounts throughout 2020-21. This has included monitoring delivery of delayed value for money conclusions by the auditors and responses by the external auditors to objections to the accounts. I can report progress in that the 2017-18 value for money report was presented to the committee on the 25th of November 2021 by our external auditors BDO. This included findings of breaches of procurement rules in two areas in 2015 and 2016. These were around winter, winter gritting and consultancy services. As well as hearing from BDO, the committee considered the progress the Council has made since those matters arose in 2015-2016 and further actions to be implemented now in response to the findings. These include improvements to systems, culture and communications. The committee has agreed to closely monitor these actions and receive a further progress report in spring this year. And finally, Council will recall a high-profile issue relating to the tenancy of Manor Farm, which was publicly reported in 2020-21. This was first raised with the internal audit team in 2019. The Council has responded positively to the issues identified by auditors, and the action plan to address the concerns is in the public domain. And I'm pleased that further reports will go to Constitution and Ethics later this month and then to Audit and Accounts in March 2022. 
So on that basis, Chair, it's recommended that the full council note the content of the report. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody like to speak on this item? Thank you. Item number, uh, item number 13 is appointment to outside bodies. I move as chair that Councillor Kathleen Ray replace Councillor Hilary Cox Condren as a Labour representative on the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Fire Authority. Can I ask my vice chair, Councillor Ki Kindersley, to second? Uh, so seconded, Chair. Forgive me, do, we do not appear to have taken a, a move to adopt the Audit and Accounts report. We're just noting it. We do not need okay. to do that. Thank Sorry. you. Sorry to interrupt. Sorry, was there a seconder? Uh, so seconded, Chair. Thank you. Um, anybody like to speak to that? I don't see any dissent, so I think we can take that as carried. It's now almost 2.30. We should stop for a break, but we have uh, just a single item left. So unless anybody disagrees, we'll keep on moving. Thank you, Councillor Bowden, for your gestures. <laughs> <laughs> Next is item 14A, Cambridge and Peterborough Combined Authority and uh, Overview and Scrutiny Committee oral questions, which will be dealt with in accordance with the protocol set out in Annex 1 of Part 4.1 of the Council Procedure Rules of the Council's Constitution. This generic report summarising decisions made by the Combined Authority's formal committees is included on the Council agenda as pages 34 to 61. Can you please raise your hand if you wish to ask a question of Councillor Nesinga, the councillor's appointed to the board? Is, is there any hands? No? Put my glasses on. No hands? Thank you. Sorry. Yes. Uh, can you also please ask, raise your hand if you wish to ask a question of councillors Atkins and Goldsack, the councillor's appointees on the overview, overview and scrutiny committee? No hands, thank you. Uh, agenda item 14B is written questions under council procedure rule 9.2. We received one question by the deadline and I think you've seen the response by email. And I think that concludes today's proceedings. Thank you for everybody, thank you to officers and thank you for everybody who watched at home. Thank you very much.